This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1849, Top 5 Legacy Villains. Hi, this is Shane Kelly. Hey, it's Ian Levitzine. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Adam Murdo. And right from the 80s discotheque, I'm Chris Everly. Woo. <laughs> I was thinking arcade. Boy, oh boy. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome one and all to the show. Uh, if you're wondering, where did, they, where did that come from? Uh, <clears throat> the answer is a uh, listener of the show, uh, Steve Sousa, uh, submitted this to us uh, actually earlier today, the day that we're recording. May the fault be with you. <laughs> um, uh, a brand new theme for us to play on the show and uh, figured I might as well throw it out there uh, for you folks. Let us know what you think on the forums and the super group and what have you, and uh, it, they'll go in the rotation, as it were, for the many different themes we have for Comic Geek Speak. But uh, damn, is that 80s in all the right ways. Well, you know, <laughs> it, it, it was reminiscent of when you're watching a movie from the 80s, mm -hmm. and whenever there's a club scene, all the, all the white men <laughs> are all dancing horribly. Probably wearing like, strangely like, shaped eyeglasses. Yeah, and... Um, Pushing up sleeves it, it, in a it, white jacket. It worked perfectly. By the way, I, you'll appreciate that all of you will appreciate this. So my, my movie theater last this past week has this classics once a month. They played Purple Rain. Oh, nice. wow. And to see that on the big screen, what a thrill. Mm. It, it's funny, too, because uh, it was it. I, I, my Facebook popped up about a week or two ago. That, that was the first time I'd ever actually seen Purple Rain. It was when Prince passed. Uh, AMC had a special screening. Yeah, you mentioned that. I remember day. that. Yep. And uh, yeah, that was. It, it is such a fun, silly, stupid movie in all the right ways. Oh, yeah. Well, it's what well, all that matters is the constant concert footage. And we use the word genius too freely in our society. He was a genius. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. No question. Like Michael, Michael Jackson, pfft, nothing compared to Prince. This guy was amazing. So. Uh, well, yes, it is indeed top five legacy villains, finally. Yes. Uh, we did top five legacy heroes quite a long time ago on the show now as i, I was a long long time ago I was, I was looking back on exactly when that was and uh, i remember breaching that topic back on episode 1686 in 2018 mm -hmm. uh so uh yeah i've been on the show a while now this is weird <laughs> <laughs> uh, four years for you honey I just know. a tad it's, a, it's crazy how time flies and uh that was February 1st, 2018, for those of you looking for Top 5 Legacy Heroes, episode 1686. Should still be in the main feed if you scroll down far enough. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, yeah, looking forward to doing the villain end of things. And uh, before we do, uh, a quick word from our sponsor. And uh, that sponsor is indeed a listener of the show, Left Coast Love, Sean Wheatley himself. As a reminder, uh, for any of you who are have not checked out his Whatnot Auctions auctions over at Whatnot.com, uh, his next one is coming up on May 13th at 9 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and uh, he also has one on uh, at midnight. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's midnight on the 14th Eastern at 9 p.m. Pacific on the 13th so that's uh timey wimey and all that jazz so any of you east coasters stay up late for the auction anybody else uh stay up a little less late for the auction on the west coast but uh the whatnot site is a, a way to do very very quick auctions and uh sell your goods in that fashion kind of like tiktok meets ebay uh where there's uh live streams going on uh you know an auction goes up in this case it'll probably be bundles for reader comics and then about two minutes later, whoever uh, bids the highest uh, gets the win, and then it's shipped out to you just like that, and then on to the next item. And uh, Sean Wheat, he's been doing that for a few weeks now, and uh, he continues to do so on the 13th, as I said. And then his next one after that would be on the 21st at uh, 9 p.m. Uh, 
Eastern, uh, 3.30 p.m. Pacific, if I'm, if I'm looking at that time correctly, which doesn't make any sense. So actually, it's 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Wow, time zones are hard. Either way, <laughs> <laughs> do check it out at whatnot.com. And we thank you so much for your sponsorship of the show, Sean, and for continuing to listen for all these years. You're an awesome fella, and I covet your JLA Avengers. Uh, he was lucky enough to get that from uh, from the one of the best places to get it, uh, and that's Isotope Comics uh, out in San Francisco. So, Mister Syme handed that to him personally. That's awesome. Yep. Uh, and also, uh, of course, you, the listeners, over patreoncom slash speak. We thank you so much for your continued support of the show and for keeping us going. For all this time, yes. without you, we would be lost in this world. We'd be lost in the desert, and we don't like sand. It's coarse, and it gets everywhere. Uh, but uh, <laughs> It does. <laughs> Once it's in, it will never come out. Yes. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Comic Geek Speak. Thank you so much for that. And last but certainly not least, if you want to get in the podcasting game yourself, we are uh, collaborated with Lipson now. Uh, we are uh, one of their... Uh, co-conspirators as it were so if you head on over to uh, lipson.com and use the promo code cgs free you can get the first two months of your of your hosting absolutely free so go do that why don't you lipson.com <sighs> i'm tired of talking already here we are folks <laughs> well, let's uh let's take a moment just to acknowledge the passing of one of the great icons yes. in the field which is of course neil adams mm -hmm. who passed very recently at the age of 80 um I mean, we'll talk more about this in probably next comic talk, but yeah, I just I just think it should be acknowledged when we talk about artists that had a, a transcendent impact on the medium. I, I consider him definitely in that category. Um, when you look at his work, you know, from the '60s and the 1970s, I mean, you knew it was Neil Adams, and oh, you sure. saw the dynamism in his work. I mean, it, when I think back to like the, the X Men he did with Roy Thomas, um, the Kree Scroll War stuff, of course, his Batman stuff, which is that there you go, which is legendary. Yep. You know, there's that dynamic style combined with some, this very, for lack of a better term, realistic approach to, 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 the, to, the, to the figure, the shape, the body, musculature, everything. Um, one of the most exciting artists, I think, in the history of the medium. And it's also important to note that he really stood up for creator rights early on, yeah, certainly. Um, going back into the, into the, you know, the 1970s. He was involved to get Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster their credit on the Superman film. Um, I remember reading stories how in the 70s, they, they had what was called the, uh, Ameri the, the American Academy of American Comic Book Art, something like that it was called. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, Stan Lee saw it as like a way to like promote comics where, where Neil Adams saw it as a way to try to create like a guild or a union for professionals. So he was always in the forefront of, of trying to correct the, as we all know, the many injustices of that industry when the way they treat their talent. So... Rest in peace. Oh, look at that cover. Holy mackerel. Gorgeous. Yep. Rest in peace. And, and we can do a bigger retrospective down the road, but it's just important to mention that. Definitely. I was, uh, I was at, um, I was picking up something down in Lancaster, Pennsylvania that my wife had ordered. And uh, I stopped by the comic store and I kind of knew I didn't have this, but when I saw it being that it was the weekend, I couldn't resist. I picked up the um, Batman Ra's al Ghul mini that was more recent. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I flipped through it. The, the art is, as of course, just gorgeous. Oh, sure. Yeah. And then I still have, I have my um, three volumes of the white, white jacketed hardcover Neil oh, yeah. Adams books. Um, yeah. I think it was the first New York Comic Con that we were at. I took those and one each day I took and had him sign, asked him to sign them. Um, he was very gracious. We had nice conversations about Batman and comics in general. Uh, it was only a few minutes, but it was a lot of fun. Um, by the by, the third day, he kind of joked when he said, "Ah, back again," or something like that. Which I got a kick out of. But the, they, those are the nice. collections of his, of his work with Denny O'Neill, right? Yeah, Shane, those are classics. Yeah, yeah, and, and and for that matter, I mean, it has to be said, you know, as as you basically just pointed out, Shane, by showing that uh, miniseries was still working in the in the industry. Oh yeah, I mean, he was eighty years yeah. old and still running strong. I think even. I'm pretty sure he did a cover for that new run of X-Men Legends that's uh, that's coming out, the Roy Thomas. Oh, wow. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's at least one Neil Adams cover on that. Uh, it could have easily been in, you know, file cover or what have you, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, absolutely <sighs> seminary human being in, in the in the industry and, you know, the industry won't be the same without him. So, yeah. 
here's here. Yeah, I, I enjoyed my my nice conversations with them. Mm -hmm. A couple minutes long each day, but it was it was a lot of fun. Were we gonna say, Mert? Uh, he's a man who almost single-handedly triggered a massive paradigm shift mm -hmm. around the end of the Silver Age as far as what comic book hero art or comic art in general could be or could look like. Yeah. And he helped to elevate the superhero genre. Exactly. A lot of the silliness that had come to define it in the latter half of the 60s. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Like when you look at it, the way he drew those the, the characters, the figures, there was such a, for lack of a better term, an authenticity to what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, like his Batman or his girl, like his classic Green Lantern, the, the, the issues with um John Stewart and the Green Arrow, and of course, yep. my ward's a junkie, the famous you know, speedy on heroin cover, <laughs> relevance, which is a classic, yeah. But I, I mean, you, you like Murd said, you, you weren't accustomed to seeing heroes rendered that way, mm -hmm. um, where they they you know, for like and like a better thing, they just look real, yeah, um. And when I think of like him or like a Steranko, like Murray said, like in that latter Silver Age period, they really left a, a, an indelible mark on the evolution of the comic book. Absolutely. Yep. And as, as previously stated, we'll definitely have more to talk about uh, on Neil on Neil Adams' you know career when we you know get to our next comic talk. But certainly glad that you brought it up, Chris. Absolutely. Of course. Yep. All right. Let's uh, get into the matter at hand. All righty. Uh, another brand spanking new top five for us to sink our teeth into this one top five legacy villains uh, and uh, that would be uh, villains that uh, quite literally have a legacy you know whether it be the son or daughter of whether it be you know someone else who has taken the mantle of of said character or something you know along those lines yeah sometimes uh, by force <laughs> That, that, that too, yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we'll be addressing that, uh, you know, in many different forms here on this episode. And of course, just because it's our top five now doesn't mean it'll be our top five tomorrow or next Tuesday or a week. Or in 15 <laughs> minutes. Or in 15 <laughs> minutes. That's or, true. Shane or, always agonizes over these things. Oh, I do. Because I was thinking completely <laughs> a different way. So I was rewriting some of my list now and I've got it <laughs> pretty good. Okay. But I'm still struggling with a couple. Mm. Now, these definitions are open, Shane. So whatever I know, you I know. Just build your list around that, and no man shall say thee nay. <laughs> like everyone who's bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as usual, we'll go around the horn with our picks, and then get a little bit more in depth on them after we say our picks. And uh, we'll start it off with our number five. And Chris, how about you start it off with you with your number five? Oh, sure. With a caveat, Shane, if you pick this one too, I'll leave it to you to really go into the description. <laughs> So number five is from Starman, The Mist. Ah, nice. That's my number one. Uh, okay, then <laughs> no, I won't fine. say a word. Yep. Hey, Plan B. Wax, <laughs> speak as much as no, you want. No, I'm going to leave it to you. Because that'll, that'll just mean at the end I can go, I like everything Chris said. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It's well, good. I, I gave Kyle a wide I mean, sorry, Nash a wide berth. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> my, my number five, Ezekiel Stain. Ooh. Is that yep. uh, well, the, the spider avatar character from the... No. Nope. nope. That would be Obadiah Stane's son. And, Stane. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Stane. Well oh, using the gotcha. Fraction okay. Iron Man run in the Fraction mm -hmm. Iron Long Man. Ezekiel. Good pick. Good yep. pick. Okay. All right, Murray, what's pick. number five? Carnage. Ah, that's, well, that's a good one. That is a good one. Mm. Yep. And Shane? I'm going to go because thinking about it, it's, it's the one I think I realized first earliest uh the various goblins of spider-man mm. mm. the many goblins yeah those, those those are all way up high on my list oh mm. yeah so. yep yep all right chris uh you want to just uh, so go, all go i'll say about the mist just quickly because i want to leave most of this to shane because out of respect and affection <laughs> um what i love about the rendering of, of this character is i think robinson really goes and takes pains to emphasize how disturbing and troubled you're going to be as a human being if you're raised by a supervillain. Mm. Um, and the way she's used in Starman, because I, I find the character incredibly creepy. Um, and, you know, like the, the seduction, all the stuff that goes on in that, those stories, um, it, it, it always really stays with me how 
there's and again, it's the, the writing is so good. There's part of it that almost feels a bit of sympathy for how clearly screwed up this person is. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I mean, she's doing such nefarious things, and, and uh, it's just, it's just, I think it's just a great example of you know the damaged legacy of of of, a, of being a supervillain. Like if you are doing what you're doing as a result of what came before you. In this case, it's your actual parent. Yeah. Um, I, I just think it's a great rendering, uh, you know, of, of the the impact of, of being raised in that type of environment and what you then do with it, which of course is nothing good. So that's my number five. I'll leave more of it to Shane. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm glad I'm glad that uh, that Mist is getting getting the love that uh, that she deserves. I mean, obviously, our most recent book of the uh, book of the month, we you know discussed it in depth. Uh, you know just how much we love that entire series, but yes, she, you know, she's she's a villain of circumstance, but also at the same time, uh, incredibly creepy at times. Just, oh yeah, the ooh. horrible things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the slaughter of the Justice League Europe. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Yep. So super super duper glad to see it to see it on uh, multiple lists. Um, my my number five, as said, Ezekiel Stain. Now, Good pick. thank you. Uh, I I love this character, and as said, uh, Ezekiel was uh, very very pivotal p- pivotal in the first couple of runs of uh, Matt Fraction's Iron Man. Great, great Iron Man stuff. Ugh. Superb. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'd say up until Cantwell, probably my favorite Iron Man series. I would agree with that. And yep. well, Roca's art made it just you know that much more. Excellent. Of course, uh, but. What I what I appreciate the most about Ezekiel Stain is that unlike his father, you know, Obadiah was this, you know, powerful, you know, strong individual, but he was also, you know, like double the age of Tony. You know, like like he, you know, he he was he was this figure that was, you know, always like above Tony in some ways, but also incredibly jealous of him and, you know, had that's, you know, kind of was his whole bag. With Ezekiel, this was a contemporary of Tony. And in some ways, almost an equal of Tony, the way that he was that he was presented, especially after he undergo underwent his own sort of you know extremist tr- treatment and got Iron Man abilities of his own. Um, he was a he was a force to be reckoned with for a while there with Tony, and and honestly, if anybody could have put him down at that time, it would have been Ezekiel. Uh, because he had the, you know, he had the tech knowledge, he had the the strength, he had the abilities, and he also had the money. And if there's one thing we know about the corporate world is that it takes money to take down money, and and that's that's what Ezekiel <laughs> had had going for him in in many different ways. And loved him as a as a foil for Tony. And frankly, I wish that they could bring him back in one way or the other. I know that uh, you know Matt Fraction's run kind of kind of had like a. A, a finite ending for the character in a lot of ways, but it's never stopped the character before from coming back. And I could, I could, and, and what I liked about the, I agree. The fracture run is, is one of my favorite Iron Man runs period. But what I yeah. really liked about the way he captured this villain is that agree with everything you said, Ian, I also found him and I forgive my language, a complete snot nose shit. Yes. <laughs> and um, like, he was really hateful. Like I, I really didn't like the character. And I mean, that's the point. Like I really found him d- d- despicable on every level. Yep. Um, like he's the kind of like he just wanted to like slap him. Like he was just, ugh. It's it's almost like picture like some kind of like version of like Mark Zuckerberg as a supervillain. Like it was just yeah. like can't stand him. Mm-hmm. So good and stuff. That's, that's frankly the direction that I felt like Matt Fraction was uh, was doing it. Like almost like old money versus new money. Yeah. Uh, in that way, you know, Tony being the established old money at this point in the Marvel universe, and then in comes Ezekiel with his you know with his father's money, inherited money, which. Tony also did himself, but also you know, plenty, made plenty himself. You know, coming in sort of as like the you know the the Twitter or the TikTok of uh, of of the Marvel universe, <laughs> in and being like, well, I can be as powerful too, and I can take you out, and that's certainly what Ezekiel attempted to do uh, at that point in time. So, like, really enjoyed him as a character, and I'd love to see him introduced in the MCU in hmm. one form or another as well. So there maybe we Jeff Bridges had offspring. Yeah, you never know. You never know. All right, there's my number five, and Murd, your number five. Okay, uh, we're talking about Carnage here, folks. Uh, a character that's celebrating its 30th anniversary in the Marvel Universe this mm-hmm. year. Wow, 30 years of Carnage. God, 
<laughs> and uh, also celebrating a 30th anniversary simultaneously is uh, me as a comic book collector because uh, right, uh, as of this very month, actually, I think this is when I chill. picking up uh, Marvel's Infinity War and crossovers and therefore became an official comic book collector. And Matt, of course, was there as my pusher to, you know, just <laughs> look me along. Um, so, yep, there we go. Um, uh, Ian is showing on the screen right now the cover to uh, Web of Spider-Man number 103, which is part 10 of 14 <laughs> of the uh, badly overextended maximum. Yeah, card. they knew how to run into the ground. Now, yeah. that, is, that is a 90s crossover right there. If you don't have at least yes. 14 parts to your crossover, you are not <laughs> from the 90s. That, that yep. is as Marvel in the 90s as it gets, yes. Exactly. Like, they realized they had a hot commodity on their hands, and they immediately <laughs> mined it just barren. Yeah, they strip-mined it, for God's sake. Yep. Yeah. But, yes, Carnage, he does qualify as a legacy character because uh, his symbiotic other, that red thing crawling all over him, is literally the offspring of Venom's symbiotic costume. So he is, in a way, a legacy, and he's also, in a way, kind of a an advance and an inversion of an already strongly iconic character, a character that had instant fan resonance when he was created. Invent I'm talking about Venom here. Um, so Venom was scary. Venom was an awesome visual. Venom had interesting mental, psychological hangups. Um, but he also had uh, kind of implicit uh, anti-heroic tendencies. He had this weird hang-up about uh, killing innocents and wanting to protect them, in fact, as the lethal protector. Uh, he only really wanted to kill Spider-Man, and he seemed strangely reluctant to do that right off the bat, uh, even. Uh, so I, I guess uh, introducing Carnage was kind of a way to produce uh, a shadow of a shadow here, just uh, refining the scariest elements of the Venom character and uh, making them even more scary, giving him that really creepy death's head visage with the spiky teeth and the large trailing eye, eye patches. He kind of looked like Venom if you turned him inside out, mm. uh, both visually and morally, because uh, the man inside the symbiote, serial killer Cletus Cassidy, had nothing like Eddie Brock's moral compass. You know, he had no compunctions about killing innocents or anyone else for that matter. He was just, he, he was Venom advanced. He was a more extreme and bloodthirsty version of Venom. And you know, he was... He was scary and compelling. He didn't have a whole lot of depth to him, perhaps. I mean, I, I know, Chris, you've remarked in the past that uh, Carnage is not a character for which you have a whole lot of patience. But no. uh, to Matt and I, a couple of teenage nudniks back in the early 90s, this, <laughs> this character was really compellingly cool. Uh, we, we were both kind of Carnage fans right from the bat. Right off the bat. And uh, he's, uh, some of that still uh, resounds in my mind uh, to this day when I think about Carnage. I mean, I, I don't like everything that's been done with the character over the years necessarily. I can certainly agree that he, he's uh, run into periods of overexposure, as has his uh, parent, Venom. Mm -hmm. um, but there have been moments along the way. Um, I, I did enjoy that uh, Jerry Conway written uh, Carnage solo series from a few years ago. I nominated that for a few things uh, that that year's best of. So it, it read like a classic Marvel, like Bronze Age monster series. Conway. Ugh. Yep. Yep. So, yep, he's uh, classic uh, 90s uh, Marvel badassery, and he does technically <laughs> qualify as a legacy. So, yeah, he's I, I stuck him right there at the end of my list. And, you know, some, right. some, of, the, some of the scariest bonding moments with, uh, with Carnage over the years, I remember, uh, you know, I mean, since we are talking 90s here, when, when Ben Riley had the Carnage symbiote for a short time. While oh, he yes, running around spider and, Carnage, right? Yes. <laughs> That that was that was some of the creepiest moments in that entire Ben Riley run was him basically trying to control himself and not you know lash out and immediately destroy the people he loves because he's being influenced by the Carnage symbiote. So that's it, it's it's not just the man; it's the symbiote itself that's a bloodthirsty thing, uh, to say the least. Yep, apple fell rather far from the tree in in the case of that uh, reproduction. Indeed. Yep. All right, Shane, over to you. All right, uh, the Goblins. So I started reading Spider-Man. I want to say, oh my God, I can't remember the number. Was it 289, part of the gang war back in the you, late you, 80s? You've said, that, you've said that in the past, yes. And that, that's where I started. And I think that one had a cover of Hobgoblin on it. And the Rose was involved, which is, of course, yep. Kingpin's son. From that point on, reading Spider-Man from that point 
going forward, I also went backward a little bit, started to learn a little bit about the green goblin, the hobgoblin. Um, it fascinated me that some character, Harry, Harry taking up the green goblin, that you had not only father and sons being the goblin, but you had other people impersonating it just to uh, battle uh, Spider-Man. That is a notorious issue right there. Yeah, I, oh, it totally is. I found that issue at a yard sale in Stone yeah. Harbor about 15 years ago. Oh, one, wow. of the, one of the biggest disappointments of my comic reading world. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yep. Um, but I, I, think, I think the goblins in general are just one of Spider-Man's most notorious foes throughout his entire career. And they keep coming back and thwarting him more and more. Sometimes terribly so, and sometimes to great disappointment like this, like uh, um, Norman doing so much more to Spider-Man's history than what we ever thought for a while. Then thank God that all got erased. Um, <laughs> but but I, I think... I think Norman and Harry and the various goblins thereafter and, and all intertwined definitely give Spider-Man a run for his money mm-hmm. and prove to be a good, a good addition to his rogues gallery. And again, one of the first Spider-Man comics I ever read featured a goblin. And then I became a little bit more fascinated with the, the premise. Well, Shane, I'll have a lot more to say about some of these characters in the future, but I will say this retroactively, it was a trick. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. It, this it, wasn't yeah. the issue you were waiting for. Yep. <laughs> I, yeah. I, yeah. I, it was Roderick Kingsley. Damn it! It was Roderick <laughs> Kingsley. Oh man. I, and, and I, I'll tell you, I, I was gonna have specifically Harry on my list until I thought about it for a little while and thought to myself that if it, if it was Harry that ended the way that Harry originally ended, he would have been on my list them bringing him back the way they have over the years in various different forms of kind of just like, it's, it's like introducing extra water into an already full dam. Like it, it's, <laughs> it, it's a mistake. And mm. I, just from some of the stuff that I've, I've seen from Nick Spencer's run specifically with, uh, with Harry, mm. right. it, it's just soured me even further on it. So, well, Ian, I'm going to talk about Harry later, but only in a very specific context. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and all of, all of my affection for it is very one nostalgic and two, mm-hmm. everything like 2000 and before. Oh yeah. Well, mm-hmm. I'll talk about this later, but Harry should be dead and let's leave it at that. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I, so, I agree with you. Yeah. That was a, that was a, that was a hero's death. And yeah. that's, that's what he deserved. The other thing I'll say is that for years, I related to Hobgoblin more than I related to Green Goblin because of the Spider-Man animated series from the 90s. Oh, sure. Which sure. started <laughs> off with Hobgoblin and then eventually- Mark Hamill doing the voice, right? Wasn't it Mark Hamill? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Eventually we got Green Goblin on that show, but uh, but for quite some time, it was all you know Jason McIndale uh, Hobgoblin that they that they were working with. Mm. Uh, and they did a, a great job with that on the, on the 90s series, making him a menacing, scary- Mark Hamill character. So, enough said. I love that series. That's so good. It's so good. All right. Over to our number fours and uh, Murd, start us off. Okay. I'm going to go for my deep cut here. Uh, a character called Mad Jack. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, Shane, you're number four. Uh, I'm going to double up on my Marvel right away and say the Hellfire Club from X Men. Okay. Ooh, nice. Ooh, that's done. interesting. Yep. Uh, Chris. So Shane, once again, if you had this one, I'll be brief. My number four is Talia Al Ghul. <laughs> nice. Ta- Talia was on my list, but I have tons of extras, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go with one that uh, is a legacy in name, and I'll take it. Secret Six. Ooh, okay. All right. Mm. Mm-hmm. Very good pick. All right, Murd, over to you. Okay. Oh, well, like Shane, I'm doubling up on Marvel here at the beginning. And not only that, also doubling up on Spidey because uh, Mad mm. Jack was a Spider-Man opponent. Oh. Um, he and or she, because the identity was kind of a tag team legacy situation, as we'll see here. Um, uh, Mad Jack turned up during um, J.M. DeMatteis' second go-round, as, uh, possibly even the third, on Spectacular Spider-Man oh. uh, in the 90s. Uh, this was uh, a great run. 
Uh, late 1996, he was paired up with artist Luke Ross. Yep. And the Mad Jack character was introduced in whichever issue of Spec Spidey uh, was on stands in October of 1996. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mad Jack is basically another take on the, uh, the classic uh, Marvel villain uh, Jack-O-Lantern. Uh, but with a couple of important twists. Um, this Mad Jack referred to himself uh, as Mad Jack, as opposed to Jack-O-Lantern, uh, spoke with a, a fake Irish accent, which is something that no prior Jack-O-Lantern had uh, deigned to do, and uh, had a bag of tricks that uh, was much deeper than the prior jack o Yeah, okay, well, that's... Yeah, that, that image doesn't really do the character justice, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's... I recognize it. It came from one of the handbooks. Yep. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, Luke Ross's art made uh, Mad Jack look a little bit more menacing. He's like, a great uh, artist. Oh. It wasn't just a, a beach ball on his shoulders. It was it was menacing looking. And he had a, you may have noticed in that image Ian just had on screen, uh, this uh, Mad Jack had an animal sidekick, a black cat named Maguire. Ah, nice. Yes, which is actually a, a clue to Mad, one of Mad Jack's true identities. Um, he uh, was on his little round hover platform, as past uh, jack-o'-lanterns had tried to do. Um, but uh, where other jack-o'-lanterns just threw your usual, like, uh, grabber ghosts and little incendiary grenades, you know, poor man's pumpkin bombs, basically. This one did things that seemed eerily supernatural. You thought that, like, uh, somebody shot a bullet at uh, the pumpkin head and it actually exploded. In a shower of... Uh, and also, uh, he could remove it, as we're seeing in this sample art. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yep. yeah, this, this was a much more interesting and much more macabre and Halloweenish take on, on the Jack-O-Lantern uh, character. Mm -hmm. And I, I was all for it. Uh, he had a special vendetta against J. Jonah Jameson, in fact. And uh, in his first appearance, I think he, he produced a spooky-looking pillar candle... And he dripped some kind of sinister wax all over J. Jonah's face, which then took control of his mind and, and forced Jonah to publish something that Jack wanted him to publish. I don't quite remember the details, but eventually we do, after a while, well, Jam DeMatteis went into this without having a specific plan in mind for who was actually under that floating pumpkin head. Um, so he, he was kind of an open signifier for DeMatteis. He figured he'd... He would either reveal who Mad Jack really was eventually or wouldn't as the mood took him. But uh, later creators then uh, connected the dots as far as Mad Jack was concerned and gave him a uh, past and an identity. And it turned out that uh, he represented two different villain pedigrees. Um, uh, well, Jack O'Lantern most obviously, but uh, the, the people inside the suit were two different people with uh, connections to Mysterio, who were carrying on in his stead because this was 1996 and... Uh, uh, Oh, yeah, Mysterio was still around at that point. He was, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it was after Mysterio had uh, shuffled off this mortal coil in Kevin Smith's Marvel Knights Daredevil mm -hmm. that we eventually learned that the people behind Mad Jack were uh, Danny Burkhart, who uh, was the, uh, the very temporary second Mysterio, uh, who had been hired for that role by J. Jonah Jameson and then kind of left him in the lurch afterwards, which <laughs> explains his vendetta against Jonah. Ah, uh, Jameson Another hiring one. people again. Always goes <laughs> awry. Yep. And the other one was Maguire, or Maggie for short, Beck, who is a long-lost cousin and admirer mm. of Quentin Beck, the original Mysterio. And, and I guess the, the cat was named after her. So that's <laughs> it's certainly not, not a major legacy bearer uh, in the villain community by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a great visual and just very well and creepily executed by Demetrius and Ross in that series. And it's, it's, it's a character that's always stuck with me. Uh, from uh, those those days in the 90s. And uh, there, there have been other takes on Jack-O-Lantern since then. Uh, Rick Remender wrote an especially uh, creepy and memorable one in his Venom series. Um, which, But uh, it, it, I, I do kind of prefer Mad Jack, as, as, as Demetrius and Ross provided. Good deep cut, Merton. Yeah, that's cool. I, I don't even remember that character, to be honest with you, Merton. I love that it's part of Mysterio's heritage in, in yeah. a lot of ways. I didn't know that either. That's great. I was I was reading Spider Man somewhat regularly at the time, and I barely even remembered who Mad Jack was until you know looking at the at the cover images that you know sparked my remembrance. And and yeah, it was really especially the taking the head off part. That was the creepiest part of the whole thing. It was like you know because wait a minute, there's nothing under there. What's 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 going on here? Like is this another is this another one of those like mystical villains that Spider Man seemed to be incredibly fond of back in the '90s, or is this something True. more? And uh, and it. Very, definitely turned out to be something more in the end. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Over to number four. Uh, Shane, go ahead. 
Um, Hellfire Club. I was trying to think of of I, I'm not as as well versed in Marvel villains committed to memory, but I absolutely love the idea of the Hellfire Club. Not only just because they menace the X Men, but their their history, their their heritage that they keep evolving their membership, and they're always there behind the scenes for years and years and years. Um, just just an interesting and. I, I like the way they're designed. I like the way they look. Very historical to me. Well, yeah, they pat themselves their 18th century uh, fashion. Yeah, so. it, it was just a, like a something new and refreshing to me when I first started reading them and uh, saw them in X-Men books. And, and that just kind of always stuck with me. It's it's mostly their visual. I, I really couldn't tell you a lot about their history. I just love the idea of them and how they continually reinvent themselves and still menace the X-Men all throughout it that's a great pick shane because if you look going in the history the hellfire club has been around for oh since colonial times at least yeah so oh, yeah. you know the, the, that's i mean that's just legacy built right in and like you said when they when they introduced the dark phoenix saga they're, they're such exciting villains they're so the, the way they look and and you know the damage they cause i mean yeah you know, their, their machinations are what send Jean Grey completely over the edge at the end and become become dark phoenix and 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 it still floors me that emma became such a such a member of the x-men in later years sure. that i just think that this, this, she was part of the hellfire club right you, oh you God, guys yeah. all remember she's the that, white right? queen yeah. <laughs> yeah like like i'm thinking of the x-men you guys remember this right <laughs> she was well, not good right <laughs> to be to be fair though shane you know who else was a member of the hellfire club at one point uh storm well <laughs> yeah you know, yeah. Roberto da Costa was the leader of the whole thing for a little while. Yeah, there. yeah. That's, that's that's very true. Yep. Uh, Magneto was a was a member of the Hellfire Club yep. at one point. Uh, it, it's it's one of the it's one of the villain groups that has had the most staying power with the X Men over the years, and it, and part of it is that reinvention because you you can literally have anyone be a member and have yeah. it have a completely different style and purpose to it that it had you know even issues before. Um, so that that's what that's what's so great about the Hellfire Club. Good stuff. Yeah. They're just cool. Indeed. They're just the personification of American upper class decadence and corruption. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Who can forget their uh, kinky parties? They would do oh. that in the comments. <laughs> Those even, are still happening, apparently. This yeah, year. even even today, the <laughs> Hellfire... an annual event of the Hellfire Galas, like in story. Yep, exactly. The Hellfire Galas look like a sexy, sexy time. That uh, <laughs> behind closed doors, I don't want to know what's going on. <laughs> uh, what happens on Krakoa stays in Krakoa. All right. <laughs> Chris, over to you. With All your... right, Talia. So I've always been fascinated by this character because kind of like the myths, but it's just a longer history in that they're depending on the circumstances, there are periods where you feel sympathy for her, you're 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 enamored with her, you you you're you're fascinated by her relationship with Batman. And then circumstances ensue and then you're like, oh wait, she's not someone you really want to invite over to dinner. And you know, she's treacherous. She's she she's clearly, you know, dealing with major baggage <laughs> Ooh, yeah. because of who her father is. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, the classic, you know, son of the demon graphic novel where, <laughs> you know, the, which leads to the, the birth of Damien. I mean, that, that story was back to the eighties, but um, so I, I just find her, it, it's, just, it's a great example of a legacy villain who is complex, who, again, there are stories with Talia where you, I, I actually find her so deeply disturbing because the, 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 she, her, her view of reality is just not in keeping with um, anything you would consider healthy or, or, or you know, even heroic, for example. Um, and, and her relationship with Bruce is just fascinating because oh, they, cl yeah. they clearly had this incredible, like, erotic chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, how much heart hardship and heartbreak has she caused him? Mm -hmm. Um, over there, and again, of course, the, I mean, Shane, do you remember the story? Um, was it called Death and the Maiden? Uh, there was a Death and the Maiden, yeah, yeah, that miniseries where, where I, I want to say that does Reza Ghul even kill her in that story? I feel like he does. Oh. Um, or that I don't remember, or like there was a sister involved. Like, I'm, I'm remembering this poorly, perhaps, but Death and, bottom, Death and the Maidens was and it? the Maiden, thank Death you. and the Maiden, okay. Yeah. I, I think Greg Rucker wrote that, I want to say. I believe you are correct. Yeah. Um, so there you go. But um, and I remember like when, when they introduced Damien and, and like 
I was like, this is not a good mother. Like he should not yeah. really be with her. <laughs> and uh, just a, a great visual. I mean, you know, she, she's, she's that classic, you know, femme fatale and there's so many things about her alluring, but then when you really get, you know, under the covers, so to speak, you're like, whoa, yeah, probably shouldn't be here. Yeah. But Bruce, you know, he'll keep finding himself kind of dragged back into that world. So Enamored. great character, great character. Yeah. And, and, and Chris, if you haven't watched it, I'm still working my way through it. Um, they do a few things with her in the more recent um, seasons of Young Justice. Hmm. Really? Yeah. That really lends itself that she is not a nice person. Was she an arrow? Did they have her an arrow too? They did. Yes. Yes, yes okay. they did. Yep. Yeah. How did they portray her in that? A little bit nicer than okay. anywhere else, but well, they, not extensively they, they had, so. They had both Al Ghul's uh, daughters. Daughters. They yeah. did, okay. Yeah. And Tal Talia came later. Yes. She was not the first daughter to show up. Yeah. Okay. I think and was, I, and I, mean, I, I think it was I'm Nessa. Al, I think it was Nessa Al Ghul that they introduced yeah. first. If I, I think okay. that's right. And I like how they used her in, in uh, The Dark Knight Rises. Yes. Um, where, oh, yeah. Uh, where if, if you weren't well versed in Batman lore, you didn't know that she, she, who she, what she really was. Yeah. yeah. Which I thought was a great moment in the film. So, yep. Yes, that was on my pick, but I, I can change that easily. I had, I did have some backups. All right. So I think, I think one of the more fascinating things about Talia that, that, uh, that I love bringing up is that very few people have more of a, a warped sense of what love is. Well put. Than, than, well put. Yeah. Than Talia Al Ghul. Like, because, you know, to her, Love is devotion in the form of I say you're mine and henceforth yep. you are mine whether you like it or not. And that's the way she treats both Damien and Bruce in 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 that way. Uh, you know, like like she decided, well, you're my beloved, Bruce. So guess what? You're my beloved. It, yep. whether, I like, whether I like it or whether you like it or yeah. not, you're gonna be with me. And if that means you're gonna have to if I'm gonna have to dip you in a Lazarus pit and you know basically brainwash you that way, then I'll do it. But it's going to happen. And yeah, she's well done put. so many things over the years that have been just wrong. <laughs> and, and speaking of Lazarus pits, I'm sure these resurrections are not helping her psychological health either. Oh, sir. Um, so, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a weird witch is brewing there. <laughs> to, to say the least. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So my, my number, my number four, uh, originally secret six, was a group of mercenaries uh, in the in the eighties uh, that had absolutely nothing to do with the version of the Secret Six that we wound up getting that was created by Gail Simone. Um, Don't forget you know, the sixties version of the Secret Six. Oh, that too. Another completely unrelated concept. It was more like a, a man from Uncle or like sixties spy kind of situation. With people who were selected for their special talents by a mysterious figure called Mockingbird to go out there and, uh, you know, battle enemy agents and run, what have you. Yep. Complete missions. I, I'm, I'm overcome with elation right now. Continue. <laughs> yep, I, I had to do it, Ian, because somebody oh, no, else please. I hadn't. No, by, by all means, Murden, and, and I love it when you do it, because that's uh, I, one, of the, one of the things that's so unique about, about the version of Secret Six that I love is that you know, it is its own thing, but, you know, it does have that DC heritage uh, built in, not only just with the name, but also with some of the characters that are included as part of this group. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of a modern day suicide squad in a lot of ways, only uh, Catman, you know, no, no Amanda Waller behind them, you know, poking them with a stick saying, do this or I'll blow, blow your head off. You know, this at is at first that there was kind of a Waller in the person of Mockingbird because yes. you know, remember they, they originated in the whole villains United quadrant of the, the build up to infinite crisis. Mm -hmm. So at first they did, but then they battled for their freedom. And after that, they were kind of on the run and they were their own masters beyond that. And that's when things really got interesting. Exactly. And it's a good series, Ian. Great. Oh, it's a, yeah, terrific, that was yeah, terrific yeah, series. Really good series. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Gail Simone and Dale Eaglesham worked on uh, a bunch of it. Uh, Jim Calfiore came in as the artwork, uh, as the artist, after quite a, quite a while on there as well. And yeah, Catman, Catman became a character in this. He sure did. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, you know, he sure did. Like I, I, I point to when he was walking around with you know like a, a beer a beer gut and like uh, a costume <laughs> that barely fit him, and then we get this version, which could easily be a match for Batman if, if given the right opportunity. Well, they have him confront Batman, and I forgot what mm -hmm. story it was, but they, 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 they go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Yeah. 
and and Actually, and, so. and, it, and it works out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Scandal Savage is in this. Ragdoll. Ragdoll was almost mm-hmm. a pick outside of Secret Six here because one of my favorite legacy characters, period, is this specific version of Ragdoll that's just creepy beyond belief always wearing the uh you know the the helmet and wait, except for when the the mask is off and then you see like the stitching on the face <laughs> and and what and what this character was put through by by their own father um is is truly something creepy to behold and then there's you know dead shot and there there was uh I, at one point uh knockout was a member of the group uh there was a parademon bane was a member that's uh, right but all throughout the series it was kind of like a villain family in in that aspect. Uh, you know, the Secret Six became a a group and, and a and a team, and you know, a camaraderie was formed amongst them, even as they were committing crimes. And that's what made the the book really, really work. And it sticks out to me amongst uh, amongst that era of DC Comics as one of the best best comics that was being put out. Period. Gail did a great job with that book. You're here. Yeah. yeah. Completely agree. I've actually got a couple of individual members of that group on my alternates list. Excellent. All righty. Um, we're to our number three picks. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll start us off. Uh, my number three, uh, this is my oddball pick, and it's, it's going to be a quickie, but I had, to, I had to throw it on there for my invincible love and the weird way that they are indeed a legacy. The Mahler Twins. And I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, Chris, you're number three. The Hobgoblin. Nice. Uh, Shane? Fixter from Flash. Well done. And Murd? Uh, the Mud Pack. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I had Clayface on there, but wow, that's a good one. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, so I, I, this is going to be pretty quick, and frankly, like it's almost on here, you know, just because I, I I was looking through non Marvel and DC characters that I could possibly throw in there, and the Mauler twins came to mind. The Mauler twins are are a are a a twin uh, villain uh, team that regularly shows up in Invincible Comics, um, and it's usually presented as one of them is the original and one of them is the clone, and you can never ever tell which one is which <laughs> because you know it's it like well well clearly i came up with this plan so that makes me the original uh well but, but I, I got out of i got us out of this situation so clearly i'm the original and then you see you know one of them die off and then you know a new clone is created and even that clone is going to think that they're original we go further along in invincible and it's it's not that much of a spoiler to say that they're all clones. We have no idea who the original is or if they're even out there anywhere. So in essence, they are their own legacy characters because the original, you know, made these clones and these are the clones that are running around doing all the, you know, nefarious deeds for, you know, various villains in the Invincible universe. Um, And they're usually assistants, you know, they're usually... uh, you know, setting things up rather than doing the crimes themselves, but they're utilized in such unique ways throughout the series uh, for various villains. Uh, and I, I think, I think it works pretty cool to have like two clones running around, both of which think that they're the original when in reality, neither one of them are. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are with, uh, with my very quick number three here that uh, I just had to throw in there somewhere, the Mahler twins. Hmm. Well, kudos to you, Ian, for introducing a non-Marvel in yeah. DC. Yes. Well yeah. done, brother. Well done. Thank, I, I tried. I couldn't think of a single one. Yep. Yeah. I, I was doing my best, and, and this was as close as I came to it. And you know, you can you can literally call clones legacies because, frankly, mm-hmm. they wouldn't yeah. exist without the original. So there we yeah. are. <laughs> All right. Over to uh, number three. I believe that was Chris. Next. Yes, up. sir. Let's go ahead. All right. So this is one of the easiest selections for me. Um, so. It's the, I don't know, 1983, four. I'm going to Florida, my parents on a vacation. We're in the airport in West Palm Beach and I go to a comic spinner rack. I hadn't started, I was reading comics of course, but I hadn't started getting them on a monthly basis yet. And I see the, the latest issue of Amazing Spider-Man. I wanna say 246 maybe, 245, somewhere in there. And it's Spider-Man facing you, holding up a goblin-like mask and then 
you see the back of the head of someone who's like clutching like this. And I'm like, what is this? Because I always, knew, I already knew about the Green Goblin, which I was interested in. So I picked up the issue, my parents bought it for me. And I was introduced to the Hobgoblin and I was besotted. Um, I was fascinated by the look of the character. I, I was fascinated even then by the fact that he was obviously a legacy character. I was also fascinated by the fact that we didn't know who he was. And this character is what got me into wanting to actively read Amazing Spider-Man every month. And both the Roger Stern and John Romita Jr. arc, and then after that, DeFalco and Ron Friends, they spent, I don't know how many years, teasing you as to who the Hobgoblin <laughs> actually was or was yeah. not. And it became this huge mystery. And I was hmm. fascinated by the fact that the character was obviously very cunning, extremely ruthless, um, and you know was adapting all of Osborne's equipment for his own purposes, making some improvements. And this battles of Spider-Man were epic. I mean, could because he got the serum, so he had he had strength that was equivalent to uh, Peter. And there was just so many great battles and intrigue, and he would like go after Harry to get more of Osborne's journals, and he was involved in the underworld and the Rose and. You know, they really went into great length to try to establish him as a major player, like in the underworld of New York City, which has always been part of Spider-Man's world. And uh, I just, I love the character. Um, and, and when Ian put up that issue before, 289, I was so, again, I was still, like, I don't know, young teenager, so deeply disappointed yeah. when they reveal, and I'm going to spoil it because it's been, you know, it's been decades. Yeah. That Ned Leeds was the Hobgoblin. Yeah. He was no personality. Like it, it made... <laughs> No sense. And I remember I remember I was an airplane with my mother, my poor mother. She's so loving. And she endured me talking for probably an hour about why I don't think Ned leaves the hobgoblin. <laughs> and I said, you know what? It doesn't make sense. And I went to this whole analysis. And then years later, I was like, oh, I was right. Because then they revealed who the hobgoblin actually was when they brought him back. Right. Um, but uh, I think it's just a great example of, of a legacy villain where they, where they take the, the, the seeds of the Green Goblin, but they went in a totally different direction with it. Um, and they made a, one, of the, one, of the, one of the classic rogues in all of Spider-Man's history. And I'm still waiting for a proper rendition in film because it sure as hell wasn't that Spider-Man 3, whatever the heck that was. No, no. Um, because the Hobgoblin, especially when he's drawn well, is truly frightening, those red glowing eyes. And mm, yeah. there's a great cover. I want to say it's Spider-Man 261. Charles Vest draws, who's Charles Vest, draws the Hobgoblin holding up, holding Spider-Man, but like in triumph, like in flames all around him. I was like, Wow, that's a that's a super villain. So well, that's my number three. What, what do you what do you mean Ned Leeds was uh, was Hobgoblin? <laughs> that's, that, that's that's Spider Man's best friend. What are you talking about? <laughs> that's that's what the that's what the movies told me. That's that's crazy talk. And, <laughs> and here is that image. Oh, look at that cover, by the way. Oh, look at that cover. Beautiful. That's the Hobgoblin man. That that was but, uh, a, that was a last yeah. minute change, wasn't it, Chris? Because from what I remember of my comic book lore, like it was going to be. Uh, uh, you know, someone else, and then editorial last minute swept in and made it. Yeah, I'm not. I, I'm sure. I'm sure our, our friend and colleague Dan probably went into this in the Spider Talk episodes. I haven't listened to those yet, where they talk yeah. about the Hobgoblin because they wouldn't. They would probably know best. Sure. And that's that doesn't wouldn't surprise me because yeah, that Christopher Priest when he was called James Alzey wrote a wonderful one shot called Spider Man versus Wolverine mm -hmm. from the '80s, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend because it's Priest. And he puts Peter in East Berlin before the wall falls. Um, and he gets involved in Cold War entry with Wolverine. And Ned goes with Peter like on a report on a, a newspaper story as an yeah. investigative journalist. And they have Ned die there, mm. but ju he just gets killed. And then they kind of took that story. I don't know if this is on purpose or not. And then they give you another perspective of where they show him actually as the Hobgoblin, mm. who somehow is beaten by like three assassins with no superpowers at all. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, but anyway, but uh, the, 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 have you ever read? The, have you read this one shot, Shane? No, no. Oh, I it's fantastic! I highly recommend it. Yep. It's one of the, it's one of those rare instances where Spider Man takes a life. By the way. Oh wow! Oh yeah, boy, it's really good. It's Priest. <clears throat> so, is this the one where Spider Man gets his store bought Halloween costume? Yes, of his own costume with Die Spinne in German. Yes, on the exactly, nerd. <laughs> yep. Yep. Nice. Good times. Yep. German times. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. Shane? So the trickster. Now, I knew of the trickster because of Flash's rogues gallery, but I never read much about um, James Jesse. However, when he got 
reintroduced as Ac when Axel was reintroduced as the trickster during um, was it Mark Wade's run? I believe or uh, Jeff, Jeff Johns. It was, it was Jeff Johns. Jeff Johns. Jeez, um, uh, Jeff Johns' run. I, I, at that time, with everything happening in the DC universe, I was really getting more deeply into the legacy of DC characters in general, and I just got the biggest kick out of a legacy villain because. To me, I, I guess I didn't, I wasn't really equating it the same way as I would like Murd's Mud Pack or Talia and Ra's al Ghul. I was just thinking, wow, here's somebody who's picking up this mantle to be our Flash's Rogues Gallery member and, and really, in, in most ways, a lot more dangerous than I think the original Trickster was, a lot more vicious, hmm, a lot um, more obnoxious, a lot more obnoxious. But I just absolutely loved everything that Johns did with the Rogues Gallery at that time. And I just thought it was a great addition. While you had all the other normal rogues around you, you had this new legacy guy coming in and, and trying to make a name for himself um, in Flash's run. So I, I just latched onto it and thought it was a cool idea. Yeah, and I, I agree with you that uh, it was cool to see a, a character that young being mm. introduced into the rogues gallery as well because you know, you're thinking to yourself, like, how, how could how could they stand him? You know, he's, yeah. he's, <laughs> he's just that much of a, like he was a, a cocky a, SOB. Yeah, he, yeah, he was. was a child of the jackass generation. He was one of those, yeah. boys yeah. that was out there with their, you know, smartphones or you know, he, he actually predates the introduction of smartphones. So I, I don't know, like, like mini cams recording themselves, doing ridiculous stunts and pulling dangerous pranks on people in the hopes of getting like some kind of mail order video deal out of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he's he is pretty vile, but uh, he's a well conceived <laughs> successor to yeah. uh, the the identity that James Jesse came up with. Yep. Some of my favorite moments were when the rogues were basically, you know, teaching him the ropes. You know, like, mm -hmm. like uh, where where they would step in and be like, "Not, nah, nah, you got to do it this way," or yep. it, it, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just just watching Captain Cold just just give him a quick like quit it. That's that's <laughs> that's good stuff right there. Yep. Rain it in, Junior. <laughs> All right, Murd, go ahead. All right, the mud pack. Okay, now this one, <laughs> the one thing I'm, I, I think, with this one item on my list, I think I'm approaching legacy the way Shane has been so far on his list. Because what I'm surmising here, Shane, is that you were thinking more in terms of uh, villain legacies as opposed to legacy villains. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, in in my original list. I kind of tweaked it for this, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, it's a list of like whole lineages of villains as opposed to just individual characters. Well, this is one time where I went in your direction and I just put this whole uh, collection of every character that has assumed the identity of Clayface because it's it's kind of interesting the way how Clayface among all of Batman's rogues gallery seems to have mudslid the way it has and then there's all these different characters that have adopted the name and and many of them at least within the first couple of decades worth of clay faces are, are have pretty distinctly different uh, uh takes or adherences to the idea of Clayface. like the original one the golden age clay face was just an old time movie monster actor Yep. Um, his name was Boris Basil Carlo. Very obvious take on on Boris Karloff, and his, his whole thing was he was uh, stalking the scene of an unauthorized remake of one of his classic films, murdering the cast in a jealous rage. Uh, so that that was his deal. He was just a guy with a mask and a knife and a towering ego. Um, but then the second Clayface came along, Matt Hagen, and he's the guy that uh, was, was more or less the template for most of the clay characters to come after. He was the one who just found that rainbow grotto of radioactive clay that enabled him to you know, turn his body into a lump of living clay that he could you know, mold and reshape and shapeshift any way he wanted. Um, and then we had the most horrifying Clayface of all, the, the Bronze Age Clayface, Preston Payne. Uh, who, he was the guy who uh, injected himself with an experimental cure made from a DNA sample taken from Matt Hagen, mind you, uh, which he hoped would allow him to remold his features because he suffered from a severe birth defect. Um, and so uh, he tried to become a new Clayface just so he could remold his face into a more pleasing shape but uh the price he paid for that was that his entire his flesh became unstable and he would dissolve into protoplasm if he did not somehow yes. communicate oh yes thank you wow that's, that's, yeah, oh he's is that he's, not a horrifying visual yeah it really is absolutely yeah. horrifying 
he locked himself up in this uh, kind of toyetic suit of armor with a, a, a like a clear plexiglass headpiece to hold his body together because otherwise it would just dissolve. And even that wouldn't have been enough to save himself if he did not somehow communicate whatever chemical instability was causing his flesh to dissolve to other people. So he, he, he became a predator. He had to go out and touch other people and just transfer this flesh melting fever he was experiencing to other people and turn their bodies into protoplasmic goo instead of himself. And that was, uh, and since Preston Payne was not really that bad a person to begin with, he had to live with the horrible guilt that this instilled in him, and that, that drove him insane. And that's what landed him in Arkham Asylum. Like, he was the first of the clay faces to be an Arkham inmate, I believe. Uh, at some point, his condition stabilized enough that uh, he had a relationship, quote-unquote, with a, a department store mannequin for a while. So huh? you may remember that there was, I think there was... That. A story written by Alan Moore, in fact, that involved uh, Clayface 3 and his uh, dummy girlfriend. And then uh, yeah, th 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 then we come to the, uh, the the Mud Pack story from the early 600 issues of Detective Comics, uh, which gave this uh, the, the, the Clayface legacy that unofficial nickname, uh, which included all the Clayfaces I've listed so far, plus uh, Lady Clay, alias Sandra Fuller, who was a member of uh, Strike Force Cobra in Mike W. Barr's Batman and the Outsiders, uh, in which Cobra used his scientists to empower a bunch of people uh, with uh, superhuman abilities reminiscent of old pre-crisis Batman villains, including Clayface. Mm. So that's how we ended up with Lady Clay. And she and uh, Preston Payne then formed a relationship. I think it was discovered that uh, Lady Clay's powers helped to negate or dampen the, 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 you know, the flesh fever that was causing Preston Payne to melt all these years. And so the two of them formed a perfect couple and they even uh, had a kid uh, whom they named uh, Cassius. Pain. You know, get it? Cassius Clay. It's <laughs> part, part of the, the theme. Yeah, and he was born with uh, innate Clayface powers. He could shapeshift the whole nine. He, he could have grown up to be the ultimate Clayface if anybody had remembered that he existed. He kind of got lost in limbo along the way. But at the end of this uh, mud pack story that Ian is displaying on screen here, uh, Basil Carlo, the one who brought all these Clayfaces together, including the then-deceased Matt Hagen. He died in Crisis on Infinite Earths number 12, if you didn't know. They even uh, had like a a little sample of his clay present at their meetings just for ceremonial purposes. And uh, Carlo, as it turned out, had an ulterior motive. He injected himself with samples from all the different clay faces, turning himself into an ultimate clay face. And uh, it's actually Basil Carlo uh, who has been uh, the uh, kind of the de, de facto default uh, secret identity for uh, iterations of Clayface that have followed, even into the uh, New 52 era, huh. uh, based on that. I mean, for a while there, uh, he actually, uh, during the uh, Cataclysm and No Man's Land story, he fell down into a crevice in the earth and got embedded with ge the conductive geode crystals and acquired uh, piezoelectric powers for a brief time. Wow. Fun <laughs> twist there, which... <laughs> also became pretty quickly forgotten. And there have been other inheritors of the Clayface legacy along the way. There was a Dr. Peter Malley who became a clay thing for like one story. There were a couple of others, uh, one that was in Will Pfeiffer's uh, Catwoman for a while, and yet another Clayface beyond that, uh, who I think was a part of A.J. Lieberman's Gotham Knights run. And uh, there, there might have been one or two others even into the New 52 era. That's, so it just keeps going and going and going. And it's, I don't know how it happened, but it does make a certain symbolic sense that uh, uh, a figure like Clayface would end up with a legacy that was as mercurial and mutable as uh, the, the, the character is himself. So it's, I can think of few villain legacies that have as few inheritors as, as Clayface has had. So I, I, he needs to be smack dab in the middle of my list. Murder. Did he first appear in the Golden Age, the original Clayface? Uh, the one who was just a disgruntled horror film actor, yes. He made okay. an appearance back in the Golden Age. And that version of Clayface was then brought back in the 70s. Gotcha. After the Silver Age Clayface, Matt Hagen had already been introduced. And, and, and Basil uh, actually turned uh, good for a while uh, over in Detective Comics uh, more oh, recently. That's right, yeah. Yep. It was part of that uh, kind of that that team, including like the Cassandra Kane and I think Batwoman, they're, they're like a bunch of uh, Bat cadets, yep. and training to defend God. So yeah, that that too. Thank you for pointing that out, Ian. That uh, yeah. the Clayface legacy takes a heroic turn at some point. Mm -hmm. Indeed. All righty. Uh, yeah, and also excellent in Batman the Animated Series. Every single oh. story involving Clayface and that. Yeah. Yep. Another. Another take on Clayface that uh, incorporated elements of several previous Clayfaces yep. from the comics. Yep. Yeah, that was that was a really good take on it. Oh yeah, yep. 
All right, over to our number threes. Uh, and uh, number two, isn't it? Oh, number, number two. Uh, well, yeah. let's just do three again. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, don't make four. me think again. <laughs> uh, Shane, go ahead. Uh, you're number two. Um, I'm going to say the Royal Flesh Gang for JLA. Ooh. Okay. Right. Nice. Uh, Chris, you're number two. Up to a certain point, Harry Osborne is the Green Goblin. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Murd? Uh, Dr. Carla Sofen. Alias Moon, Moonstone 2, alias Meteorite. Oh, good pick. I, 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 knew she, done. I knew she was going to be on your list. That's why I, I didn't, I didn't uh, go with it. But uh, instead, oh, please. Instead, I went with the Red Hood. Oh, oh that's a good one. Wow. Damn, I didn't think of that one. Shane's agony. <laughs> oh, that's a really good one. Yep. Yeah, it is. Go ahead, Crap. Shane. Um. So the Royal Flesh Gang, I, I fell in love with this group through the Justice League book in those first couple issues was issue three and four, I think they're featured in. Um, and I have gone back in JLA history to acquire and read some stories. And I like what they do with them in animation, in television shows. Um, I know it may not be directly legacy in the comics only for what I'm thinking, but I just love that the idea of this gang and, and that they can evolve and they battle a lot of different DC villains, but I always, for whatever reason, always attribute them to battling the Justice League. They're so much small potatoes compared to what the Justice League really handles, but I just always get a crazy thrill out of when the Royal Flesh Gang shows up and the Justice League battles them. Um, I love, I love, love, love the story of issue three and four of Justice League. Um, oh, look at that cover. That's a great, great. cover. Yep. Yeah. Um, always the same four characters, but they could be portrayed by different people taking up the mantles for those characters. I think in some iterations, um, Ace is even an android in yes. a lot of them. So yeah, it's it's ever evolving, and yeah, anytime I see the Royal Flesh Gang show up in something, I'm grabbing the issue of it to read. Nice. There was one point around uh, Infinite Crisis where uh, the Royal Flesh Gang actually expanded to have 52 members. Just like ah, that's right. That's whole right. deck of cards. It's like Star Girl's <laughs> father was actually a member for a little bit there before he died. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. You know, Shane, I have a fond memory of because my first exposure to those characters was in that great early Batman Beyond episode. Oh, that's oh. a great, great, yeah. so good. Which is excellent. Yeah. I mean, let me tell you about Selena Kyle. Yeah, and I love, I love what the, what they do with um, with the characters in the the Justice League cartoon, with um, ten in the park, oh, kind of going crazy. Oh. Batman goes in and yeah, sits with her, it's, so to I, speak. I, I, I may I may not be a big fan of that epilogue episode in general for what they for what they tie you know Terry into, but oh, that, right, right, yeah. that is the but, best scene of that entire episode. Yeah. yeah, that that Royal Flesh Gang scene with Ten and Batman, that's yep. one of my favorite scenes. Absolutely, yep. but I agree with you. I'm not thrilled with the way they tied in everything else. Mm -hmm. I think we are in accord there. Yeah, indeed. Yep. But uh, no, good, good, good pick in general. Yeah, uh, great pick. Ever, ever changing rogues gallery uh, a team of uh, of characters there. So nicely done. All right, Chris, go ahead. All right, so I'm kind of in keeping with what we were discussing before about Harry. Um, this was also another, another automatic on my list, but with the caveat that only up to a certain point in the character's history. So I think what strikes us so much about Harry is that even more than the mist for me is that he's such a victim of horrible parenting. <laughs> and, and even before Norman got was, was, you know, affected by the serum, he was already a son of a bitch. I mean, he's mm -hmm. a ruthless businessman. Um, he was not attentive to his son. Uh, even like leader Ramit in the early issues that they would establish that Norman was not present for his son. You know, the, 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 the mother had died. And you really see Harry, especially as the book becomes more sophisticated, struggling with mental illness um, and, and his drug problems. And, and, you know, I really like how they really went into how troubled this person was. And, and part of that was a result of his upbringing and then bad choices he made. And it all just made him all the more tragic when he decides on more than one occasion to don the mantle of the Green Goblin. 
And, you know, and, and early on, it was, it was, you know, villainous. Then he tried to actually kind of like in, in the issue uh, Ian showing on the screen, the classic 312 Green Goblin versus the Hobgoblin. Not an illusion. It, fi it finally happens. Um, <laughs> although that was the also ran Jason Massendale Hobgoblin. It wasn't as good. But anyway, um, I, I, I just was always taken by how mixed up Harry was. He was trying to do the right thing. Um, but it just his marriage, everything else, just, you know, nothing was working ultimately right for him in the end. And why I really put him on this list, though, was when J.M. Demetrius did his, uh, what I think is his superb run on Spectacular Spider-Man in the 90s, he really explored the consequences of Harry being the son of Norman and the cycle, because again, no one does this better than Demetrius, the psychological impact of all of that and how there, there it is the great, great, great picture Ooh, and how he is basically haunted by the legacy of the goblin to the point that it consumes him. Mm -hmm. Um, and how Peter is forced to, to deal with the fact that his, one of his closest friends now become one of his most dangerous enemies. Yeah. And, uh, the storyline culminates with the, I think one of the, the classic spectacular Spider-Man 200, which I think is one of the most gut wrenching Spider-Man stories ever put to page. Um, and, and the, the final pages of that story where Harry kind of, he, he, you know, his, his marriage is wrecked, like his life is just in, in a mess, but he kind of gets his, his sense of himself and, and he tries to sort of redeem himself as the goblin and loses his life in, 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 the, in, the, in the, as a result of that. And I remember this last year, it's, it's also great Sal Buscema art. It's, there's no words. It's just Peter and Mary Jane reacting to, there it is, the death of their old friend from their college days. And there's even a moving part here where they show like the old like photographs of like Gwen and all of them when they were young. And it's a great story. And, and, and they should have stopped right here. Mm -hmm. Like this, 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 this was Harry's arc. Yeah. And of course, because it's comics, they didn't. <laughs> and um but I, I i think when they really to go into like the ramifications of like if you're like all right so if someone was actually raised by the green goblin what would happen to them <laughs> and here it is and, and especially in Demetrius's hands but earlier stories too um it's it's really well done and, and it's, it's poignant like you you, you carry is, is is a tragic character and and a great example of just the the, the dark legacy of, of a supervillain. that's my number two yep that's and, a great pick. And, and that previous page where he's talking to Peter and Mary Jane and then dons the mask in uh, his face. Great art. Yeah. Just in those three panels deteriorates to madness. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's a situation where, uh, you know, sometimes you're a villain by circumstance more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and Harry was neglected, not just by not just by his father, but also by his friends for a lot of that time. Well, because, let's go you know, back to when we talked with Dan Gavazdan about Spidey 122, absolutely. when Peter leaves him in the penthouse, yep. when Harry was at his work, like breaking down and needed help, and Peter mm -hmm. walked away. Yeah. It's a key and, moment. Exactly. And, and it's, you know, he, he did his best to fight back to, to become, you know, someone, you know, worth, worth being proud of. And he had a family that took over the Osborne industry, but sure. in the end, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't escape it. And, and, and I'll say I'll, I'll say again that this is a character that also, as you've already stated, for the most part, is a character of circumstance of the business as well, because yeah. you don't cancel Spider-Man. You know, Spider-Man doesn't have a final issue. And because of that, you bring characters back because you need the story to keep rolling. You need to right. have a sense uh, in, you know, at the end of one of the worst Spider-Man stories ever that, that's ever happened you know one more day uh <laughs> it, a, essentially it resets the clock and then all of a sudden harry's back uh and they never really got to a satisfying explanation for no, that i do not, not count, i do not count <laughs> spencer's explanation as satisfying in any way uh and frankly there's a whole bunch of one of these days i'd love for somebody to sit down nick spencer at a bar and find out what his actual story was going to be because i know he left before he was actually planning on doing so but nevertheless it's a character that should have stayed dead i completely agree and and if, if for listeners if you haven't read spectacular spider-man 200 and the issues leading up to it 
it, it, it's 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 a classic. I mean, and 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 it's powerful. I mean, it's, yep. it's great stuff. Yep. Look for the shiny hollow foil. Cover. Yes, hollow foil cover. Don't I, be fooled I was, by that. Okay, I was wondering story. if that's the one it was. <laughs> yep. All right. Yep, the very one. Yep. Oh, those All right. Covers. And now, and now, justice like thunder, a thunderbolt uh, comes into the ring here. And uh, Nerd, tell us more. Yes, with uh, one of the more Machiavellian members of that team, I might add. Great yes. character. Dr. Carla Sofen. Yeah, she she's high up on my list because she's she's that exceptional legacy villain who pretty much completely overshadows the original bearer of the legacy. I don't think there are any people out there who remember Lloyd Block, who was the no. first Marvel character. What an unfortunate last know. name, too. Yeah, <laughs> Blah. So, yeah. Some writers called him Byron Becton, uh, but I don't know where that came from. But apparently, <laughs> Murd. Yeah. So, Murd, uh, uh, yeah. Carla Sofen was actually his uh, psychiatrist. She was uh, a, a totally unethical and uh, dangerously ambitious psychologist uh, who was uh, treating Lloyd Block after he had bonded with this this alien artifact, this literal moonstone that gave him the powers he wielded as the villain moonstone. Is it turned him into a man wolf? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> that's, that's that's pretty close to true, Chris. Because yeah. that there is a connection, as, mm. as, as we'll see in a moment here. Uh, but yeah, Doctor Sofen saw an opportunity uh, to seize power for herself when she was talking to this guy, and so she used her. Uh, her abilities to worm into the weaknesses and insecurities of other people. She's just a, a world-class reader and manipulator of, of, of human minds and frailties. And she was able to hypnotically almost to, to convince uh, Block that the Moonstone was turning him into a monster. So he rejected it and she immediately snapped it up, you know, yoink, and became the new Moonstone. And she used the powers that the Moonstone imparted far greater effects than uh, the original Moonstone ever had. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Hulk. And uh, so she mm. became kind of a, yep, there's the costume, which is pretty close to what Lloyd Block wore, I think, but, uh, you know, di different uh, chest dimensions, I guess is the main <laughs> the main difference. Um, and so, yeah, she, she was a, a villain in the Marvel Universe for a while. She was a master of evil. And then... She was recruited by Baron Helmut Zemo for his little Thunderbolts project, when uh, in the absence of uh, most of the Marvel Universe's heroes in the wake of the Onslaught event, uh, he perceived a need in the global community for superhuman protectors that he fully planned to exploit by presenting them with a brand new group of protectors that were actually his own masters of evil in disguise. And Dr. Carlos Sofen, as, uh, as kind of the uh, his aide-de-camp, his right-hand woman, um, one of the brains of the outfit, uh, Carla Sofen was on hand in her new identity, depicted here on screen right now as Meteorite. And she's also one of the few members of the Thunderbolts who reverted to her original name as, of Moonstone mm -hmm. uh, after uh, the, the Thunderbolts' ruse was exposed. And the team then mostly stayed together as seeking redemption. What a great series. Ugh. And so, but yes, we, we really have to get around to doing that Thunderbolt spotlight. One we do, Murd. Yes. Yep. yep. Yes, and she was one of the breakout characters, one of the most interesting characters in the group, because she, she made the mix completely volatile because her motives for staying with the group and quote unquote seeking redemption for herself were always a little bit in question, a little bit nebulous. Yep. I mean, she wasn't even really certain herself a lot of the time what she was really looking for. And Not to mention her disconcerting sexual chemistry with Hawkeye. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> The famous cover. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, indeed. But yes, even before before she joined the Thunderbolts, she was always a fairly sexual being. Yeah, you know, just uh, I guess to a certain sector of the readership, but added to her appeal. Um, so yeah, yeah, and uh, as the Thunderbolts wore on, we learned that she was actually representing not only a, a villain legacy, but a heroic one too, because as we learn a little more about the origins of her Moonstone, we find that it's actually one of a, a whole set of ancient Kree artifacts, uh, known collectively as the Lifestone Tree. And uh, it, it carried uh, the essence and uh, some like uh, received memories of the original bearer, uh, a Kree hero from um, untold millennia ago called Ajisha. And she was experiencing awesome. some like inherited memories of Ajisha, which uh, she felt were kind of influencing her to take a more heroic path. Mm -hmm. And it would just fall in step with the under Thunderbolts and seeking redemption and whatnot. Now she eventually, she silenced these received voices in her head, but uh, it, 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 it's, it's still there. I mean, that, that's the past of the thing that empowers her. And uh, it, it's probably on, on one, level, one level or another, what has uh, kind of influenced the shaping of her own legacy and, and her own motives as a character is you know, going forward from that point. And this all came to light around the time of the maximum security 
uh, crossover, I should add. And we also wow. learned that, uh, you know, getting back to Man Wolf, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we learned that several other mystic alien gem empowered characters in the Marvel Universe, including Man Wolf and also like the Basilisk. Kind of a uh, deep cut from the, the Marvel 70s. Yes, uh, sure is. Related, and they were a part of this uh, the, the, this whole Lifestone Tree concept. So, yeah, Carla Sofen, very, very interesting, very multi-layered and uh, multiply motivated character. Uh, <laughs> and it was one of the things that made Thunderbolt such an interesting series to follow. There it is. Uh-oh. Issue uh -oh. 30. <laughs> Issue 30, there, that's the kiss between... Oh. Her and Clint Barton, whom she decided to seduce for reasons of her own, <laughs> including just basic enjoyment. The, the other the other thing that I'll point out is when she was a member of the Dark Avengers as their That's uh, right. their Ms. Marvel, basically uh, when she took when she put on uh, Carol's old uh, uh, Ms. Marvel costume, uh, you know the the one that's very reminiscent to the original Captain Marvel costume. Yep. Uh, and uh, came out there with Norman Osborn and the rest of the Dark Avengers with basically the idea of the Thunderbolts just done again with a more of an Osborn flair and uh... <laughs> more of an Osborn slash Rove slash Rumsfeld flair. Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I love the character because she's also one of the few Thunderbolts that I feel like never really truly reformed. Uh, even, even, I mean, as you said, even as she was being influenced to, you know, be, be good, be better, be good, be better. Eh, she never really has. <laughs> it's not, not in her nature, really. I'll be better to myself, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yep. Well done there. All right, my, my number, my number two. Few characters have as much legacy as the character of the Red Hood, because there have yeah. been many Red Hoods over the years. In fact. At one point, it was just a moniker that people took on uh, to the point where, you know, it, there's a version of Joker's backstory, whether or not it's the version. It is a version. That's the way I like to think of the Joker is that he has a origin. We just don't know which one it is, uh, you know, in in Alan Moore's, uh, you know, famous, uh, uh, you know, Joker story. Uh, you know, we learned that that at one point. The Joker was the Red Hood, and that's quite possibly how he became the Joker, was falling into a vat while taking on, uh, you know, Batman. But it turns out that uh, he couldn't really see in the mask, and that's why he fell into the, the vat, essentially. Um, and there were many iterations of the Red Hood over the years along, this line, along these same lines, until eventually Judd Winnick came along, and we got the idea of, Jason Todd as the Red Hood, and it became a character that actually had an identity and had a purpose uh, that, uh, you know, that, that went there. You know, long past the killing joke at this point, the Red Hood is a full character uh, in this iteration. And we learned that Jason Todd, you know, basically came back to life via the Lazarus Pits. Uh, it's a long story. At one point in, in Hush, we thought he may have well, very well have been Hush, but it turned out to be Clayface, bringing it back to Clayface uh, there. And at that point, Batman thought that, well, clearly Jason Todd's not back from the dead. That was just Clayface. <laughs> well, that itself was in itself a, a ruse. Um, Judd Winnick did a terrific job with his Under the Red Hood story. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, giving us that first return of Jason. And it was so disturbing and unsettling and unfortunate the way that the entire thing planned out because, you know, this was a Robin. You know, this was, this was a character that, you know, that Batman did his best to, you know, to train and teach and ensure that, that, that he was, you know, doing good. And instead went very, very wrong for a while there. You know, he's since redeemed himself a bit more in the more modern, uh, you know, D DCU. But the name Red Hood will always be synonymous now with Jason Todd. It wasn't for a while, mm -hmm. and it wasn't for years in the DC universe, but it, it gave a actual identity to the character, and that's what made it so cool to me is, you know, the repurposing of the name. Um, and no longer just quote a bunch of guys and a mask. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Now, now it's a man very much with a purpose, and not necessarily the purpose of Batman nor anyone else. It is Jason Todd's purpose. 
uh, he's running around with his outside with his outsiders gang for a while and uh, his own Red Hood group uh, that he was running around with. Uh, Red Hood and the like, Outlaws. Yes, the Outlaws. Thank you. Uh, and just overall, love the character, love the concept, and love the execution that they've done over the years with the Red Hood. And you see this if I hold it up. Yes. Ugh. Beautiful. Page I got wow. at a Philly Con one year. Wow. Who's the artist, I mean, Shane? Uh, it was Eric Battle and uh, Rodney Ramos inked it. Ah, oh, terrific. Beautiful. Good stuff. All righty, let's get to our number one. Uh, I know, Chris, you have to leave soon, uh, so uh, we'll have you do your pick first, your number one. Honored, sir. Uh, my pick, and this was actually easy for me, Baron Helmut Zemo. Knew it. I yeah. left him off my list in, in deference to you, Chris. Oh, thanks, brother. There you go. Uh, my number one, Ultron. Ooh, oh, that's a good one, too. Pick. Oh, Ian. I'm sorry I have to leave early. Oh, tremendous. <laughs> Terrific. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Bird? The Joker's Daughter. Oh, oh that's yes. a good one. Yep. Wow. Yep, 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 yep. Oh, man. And that puts her on both your lists, if I remember correctly. Correct? Uh, I, I, was, she, was she also on your legacy hero list, if, I remember, if I'm remembering right? Was she? I, wow. I, I'm gonna have to listen. I'm gonna have to listen back to that episode, but I think it's I don't remember that, but I I must really like the Joker's daughter. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And 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 Shane? The mist from Starman. Of course. Right, right. Yes, indeed. All right, Chris. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm sorry I have to leave, so I have to go pick up my son. But um when I was coming up with the list, this is the first thing that went down and we're right in the number one slot. Because when I think of the idea of, a, of, a, of like a really effective and compelling legacy villain, my attitude is they have to, in some ways, not just emulate, but surpass their predecessor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously the original Baron Zemo, who we know from the, the early Silver Age appearances, he was killed, of course, in an early issue of Avengers, um, the first Masters of Evil. But his son, I think, so eclipses him in terms of just the sheer scope of his his plans, how evil they were, the, the damage he did. And let's let's look at a few items here. So first of all, perhaps the greatest Avengers story of all time, the Masters of Evil take over Avengers Mansion, oh, yes. which is under siege, of course, with how it's often known in terms of a collective title. But the way Zemo orchestrates that entire campaign and the brutality and ruthlessness and the hatred um, in, that he he projects towards the Avengers, and of course, Captain America in particular. I remember as a kid when I got that song, I was in seventh when it first came out. I was reading books monthly by then. And that story just blew me away. Mm-hmm. Like seeing Jarvis getting like beaten almost to a pulp and they nearly kill Hercules. And I'm like, wow, this is your granddaddy supervillains. Holy mackerel. Um, and the fact that Zemo was, was the orchestrator of all of that I just really became in awe of the character. And then I realized that back in the Bronze Age, the classic Englehart, Sal Buscema Cap stories, he originally was the character called the Phoenix, um, which was also a power record. <laughs> and uh, that's when he tried, tried to originally avenge his father's death under that different uh, persona. Hmm. And there's some, some of the classic image from the Under Siege story, but there's the whole, oh, great, great pick there, Ian. And then, of course, we get to the Thunderbolts. Yes. And what's amazing about that whole series, I, I think it's one of, the, one of the great Marvel series of, of – because there aren't many great Marvel series of the 90s in my view. That one sure as hell was. And then, of course, it went on to the 2000s. But um, it was amazing to see how Zemo was trying to use this facade to you know, have his way and, and, and further his – his diabolical manipulations, but at the same time, because the story was so well done, it's so intricately plotted, mm-hmm. you see even him starting to be affected by the fact they're supposed to actually be heroes. Right. And now he, even he is starting to be, struggle with what he's actually doing. Um, I think it's one of the most sophisticated, compelling, and complicated villains in the Marvel Universe. And uh, in terms of legacy, I think he left his father behind many, many, many issues and years ago. And um, Daniel Brühl plays Helmet, not Heinrich, correct? In the movies? Yes. Right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. I think is appropriate. Um, but this was my easiest choice for this list. I, I think he's one of the most 
again, one of the most effective villains in, in the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. Completely. Because he's so complex. Yep. Yeah. In so. some ways, he's on Doom level. I really do believe. I think that I think that's a, that's a valid valid point, Murd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he may not have the source and all that, but in terms of being a strategist, a manipulator, um, yeah, he's he's way up there. And I like how they how they used him in, in the films, especially in Captain America and the Falcon. Um, I thought they captured his his persona pretty well there. Mm -hmm. So, yep. That's my number one by a mile, brothers. And I now must go on parental chauffeur duty until my son gets his license so <laughs> this is a tonic for the spirit as always gentlemen and i wish you a fond farewell we'll talk and soon you, chris indeed. good night brothers take care Adios. indeed ciao all right excellent well my my number one pick is ultron and yet again a character that you can't get more legacy than ultron because it's a character that has been reborn and rebooted and reborn and rebooted and each and every time you get a different ultron while at the same time i feel like he's getting more and more menacing with each reboot um you know whether it whether it's just further mental capacities whether it's uh you know just just how uh you know computer programs themselves get more advanced over time or even if it itself is just learning from past mistakes and and improving upon them. Ultron started out as this, you know, helper character. You know, it started out as Pym's, you know, robot servant is, uh, at originally. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, uh, Hank Pym lost control. And we get to, you know, the further iterations of Ultron until we get things like Ultron 6, you know, the deadly, deathless dreadnought as they put it here. Uh, and you can see the the design of the character evolve over the years as well. Uh, as we got to, you know, the age of Ultron, which the movie, you know, went its, uh, its name upon, even though the story itself is very, very different. It's a yeah. world where Ultron has taken over, essentially. Um, you know, where Ultron was not left in check and was able to take down the entire world and make it his own. Um, while all at the same time, you know, Ultron is responsible for accidentally some heroes over the years, you know, that, that Ultron himself, uh, based on Hank Pym's, uh, 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 mind originally, correct? Uh, Ultron or, uh, somebody else's brain patterns. I'm trying to remember. I'm not sure he was based on anyone's really. Okay. I, I, I think he, Pim just I, kind of created his AI out of whole cloth. Got it. And it, it itself evolved so alarmingly rapidly. But then, yeah, Ultron kind of uh, pioneered the technology of basing android brain patterns on uh, th those of existing people. I mean, that's how we ended up with the right. Vision, who yeah. was built from either from the inert body of the Human Torch or from spare parts, depending on which version of the timeline you're looking at. Yep. Immortus had his hands in there. But uh, his brain patterns were based on Zion Williams's. Yep, and uh, went on to uh, Ultron went on to uh, build a couple of other android companions, uh, based on the the brain patterns of other people. I mean, you know, Oedipal being that he is, he uh, he regarded uh, the Janet Van Dyne as his mother, so he created uh, his robot consort Jocasta, who was from Greek myth, the mother slash wife of Oedipus, mm -hmm. and uh, ba based her based her brain patterns on Janet Van Dyne's. And later on, he built another one uh, named Alchema based on the brain patterns of Mockingbird, randomly mm. enough. I didn't actually know about that one, so th thanks for bringing that one up. I guess, I guess she hasn't had nearly as much playing time as Jocasta and, 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 uh, and Vision have had over the years. No, no, not nearly. Yeah. And, and mind you, you know, that, that's what's so fascinating about Ultron, too, is that, you know, he tried to create fellow villains. He tried to create a family for himself, and in reality... He created more heroes, you know, because that's 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 how they've gone over the years. Jocasta's had some back and forth, but for the most part, Jocasta has been, you know, in the world of good. And Vision is one of the greatest Avengers of all time, uh, you know, no matter what body or version he's in. But uh, Ultron as well, like Ultron, there were there have been one or two Ultrons that skewed a little bit closer to heroics, and then next reboot, nope, never mind, not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> And, and that's, you know, obviously one of the greatest stories ever told here is uh, Busiek and Perez's, you know, Ultron Un Unlimited, uh, where we get as close to an ultimate Ultron as you can possibly get. Uh, and, you know, he 
almost takes out the entire Avengers. You know, it came pretty darn close. Uh, if, if not for, you know, the some last second heroics, it could have very well wind up happening. And also, Ultron has some uh, cosmic bent as well. You know, he's 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 scoped the galaxy uh, in Abnett and Lanning's, uh, uh, you know, space opera that they crafted for for years, uh, which, you know, reintroduced the Guardians of the Galaxy and also included Silver Surfer and what happened and what have you. Um, Ultron was a very important part of that as one of the major villains of the entire galaxy uh, for a while there. So, yeah, Ultron, don't mess with him because each time he he reboots himself and each time the legacy gets a, you know, 5.2 upgrade or what, or what have you, it's going to be an even more frightening Ultron to deal with. And that's why he had to be my number one because he's quite literally himself a legacy. He is. Very well put. Yep. He's going to make all of us obsolete yet. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's he's going to get there, definitely. Yep. All right, Murd, over to you. <laughs> uh, yes, I. <laughs> you know, it's kind of coming back to me now that I put her on my uh, <laughs> hero legacy or legacy hero list. <laughs> but it's. <laughs> It, it, it's her versatility as a character and her True. just delectable ambiguity about her that she can she can bear the legacy of both hero and villain in one character in fact multiple villains in one character uh if you're familiar with her as indeed at one point i was not um she was introduced in the 70s uh she was the creation of uh, writer bob rosakis who is dc's uh, answer man of the 70s and 80s and he did a lot of uh he wrote an awful lot of uh, backup or filler material for DC during his Bronze Age. Um, and he created uh, the Joker's daughter as a foil for Robin uh, during in uh, his tales in the, uh, the Batman Family series back in the Bronze Age. He introduced her as the Joker's daughter. And then very quickly, yep, there she is in one of her early appearances going up against Batgirl. And as you can see on the cover of Batman Family number nine, as if the Joker daughter weren't enough, you're about to meet the Scarecrow's daughter, the Riddler's daughter, and the Penguin's <laughs> daughter. All of them were the same character. Yep. Just, just one legacy was not enough for her. She was insatiable. She just had to keep on adopting. She, she was kind of like a, a legacy collector. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a hoarder, even. Uh, but uh, the Joker's daughter was the one she kept coming back to, it seems. And eventually it was definitively revealed, again, by Rosakis himself during the time he was writing uh, the Teen Titans series, uh, when it uh, returned from hiatus uh, towards the end of the 70s, um, that uh, uh, she was uh, actually Two-Face's daughter. and uh, She was given as an alter ego, Duella Dent, mm -hmm. and uh, she joined the, the Titans under with a slightly modified version of her Joker's daughter costume uh, under the name of the Harlequin. And it was at that point that she became a hero and uh, began building a hero legacy for herself. But uh, she kind of uh, flopped back and forth between wavelengths over the years. Like sometimes she would pop up uh, in more of a villainous role. Other times she would uh, come to the Titans reunions in more of a heroic guise. Uh, she turned up at uh, Donna Troy and Terry Long's wedding in the 80s. It was at that point that uh, Dick Grayson pointed out, oh, yes, I just realized you're too old to be uh, Two-Face's daughter. So uh, who are you really? And she was like, oh, look over there. And then vanished into the crowd of Venom Wing guests. <laughs> <laughs> talk about mercuriality. This is one character that refused to be nailed down. One strain of morality, one legacy, heroic or villainous, was never enough for the ever voracious Joker's daughter. She was always a lot of fun, just oozing tricksterous liminality every time she popped up on a comics page. If I had only known about her when I was working on my undergrad honors thesis at Penn State, which was all about the trickster archetype in comics, I would certainly have had a couple of pages to devote to Duella Dent. Definitely. Yeah, and at some point, it was around countdown, I think, uh, in uh, <laughs> the, the, the latter days of the pre-New 52 period, uh, did, um, yet another quote-unquote definitive origin introduced for her where we were told that she was from Earth 3 all along and she was the daughter of uh, that Earth 3's version of the Joker and Two-Face who was called Three-Face. <laughs> yeah, and uh, her, her mind and or body had been kind of involuntarily skipping between parallel Earths for years and I never found that very satisfactory, but you know, Duella has always been the kind of character for whom definitive origins stuck about as well as uh, you know, dry erase marker on a whiteboard. Yeah. 
And, uh, so, and, yeah, and, and, in the, and in the new 52, they had a very, very creepy take on her where she quite yeah. the discarded face of, of Joker <laughs> from that uh, Scott Snyder story and started wearing that as her face to be Joker's daughter. It was yeah. it was disturbing. Yeah, I'm, yep. I'm shaking my head along with Shane here. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm glad you brought that up, Ian. But yeah, this is not the version of Joker's nope. daughter that I'm putting at the top of my list. Nope, nope, nope. I, I, That's I gross. Yes. It, it's a big nope. Yeah, and it's also just generally a lot, a lot less fun. I mean, Agreed. Yes. Fun with her. Yeah, who the hell is she? whose daughter is she anyway? You know, <laughs> is she hero? Is she villain? Is she a floor wax? Is she a dessert topping? We'll we'll never know. And then that's all in one. Just that, that 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 ambiguity was was always very appealing to me, and and she was just always volatile and fun, and yeah, just apparently I like this character more than even I knew because I ended up putting her on two different legacy lists, and just what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> you you know Nothing. what you're gonna you're gonna accept it and you're gonna be happy because frankly that's the versatility of the character right there. Boom, both in one. Amen. Ian. It's potato and potato. Like that's <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm gonna say I sour did, cream. Exactly. I did not like any part of that cut off face joker, joker's daughter. Nope, 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 nope. Yeah. Gross, gross, gross. Not 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 fun. Not fun. Nope. But, nope, uh, nope. At, at the at the same time though, uh we need more interaction between her and Harley Quinn. I think that there has not been nearly enough mm. over the years. Yeah. Because I think that they would hate each other and be perfect foils for one another. So just mm. Let's, let's keep that in mind. Right, right. And then yeah. throw in punchline just to... <laughs> sure. Just to put in the mix. Exactly. <laughs> uh, they are. They might as well do something with her. <laughs> All right, Shane, let's get further into the mist. Okay. Um, talk about a character who is raised by a villain, twisted, mi- Mixed, sinister, vicious, conniving, manipulating, trying to live up to what she thinks of as her father's expectations while her father is, was all about, was it Kyle? Am I remembering his name right? My God. Uh, yeah, yeah, was was her brother. Yeah, her was... brother was Kyle. They, they never referred to him as the Mist, though, in Starman. He was just Kyle mm-hmm. until he met his end. Right. And then she became the Mist. Um. She's just vicious. The stuff that she did to Jack Knight to get revenge for Kyle, um, the the demented way she manipulated him and drugged him and did other things to him, mm-hmm. yet still at the very end, giving him, in the end, in the last seconds, giving him what I would think is his greatest treasure mm-hmm. uh, is amazing mm-hmm. for this villainous, vicious, evil character um to 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 then give i don't want to say in case you read it i know it's a year ago but um it's it's a fascinating read um the journey she goes on from the beginning through to the end is just amazing her twisted sense of love in some ways um it does not do her any good throughout the series. What she does for her father, which ends up backfiring in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. um, just the absolute evilness towards Jack. Only to not do anything about it, but give him his, his like I said, his greatest treasure, I would think. Yeah. She just is evil. <laughs> and I think far surpasses her father. And, and I love that there was a, uh, you know, back in the day, DC would do the girl frenzy. Uh, oh yes, yes. Basically. And there was a, there was an issue with that uh, that was yep. that was devoted entirely to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, terrific cover, uh, mind you. Oh yeah. Uh, and and that entire story goes a lot further into uh, the mist and and what she was as a character. Definitely. Yeah. As I recall, she ran afoul of Mary Marvel in that issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Did they include this issue in the in the? Uh... Oh yeah, okay, in the good. omnibuses. They did. Yeah, no good. That's what I thought. Yeah, I'm I'm 99 sure they did. I'm pretty it's sure. Got, I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah, it's got everything in there through the run, uh, including the 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 Batman Hellboy Starman mm-hmm. issues. Yep, indeed. Yep. Yeah, and and, and the character too. Uh, like, I I felt like she was the complete opposite. Of, of Jack, you know, because Jack became a hero because 
because her because his brother you know died pr- prematurely and became a hero yeah. and and that's exactly what happened here with you know with this version of of the mist is you know stepping in to fill a a brother's legacy but while jack did it in all the right ways she did it in all the wrong ways yeah and and she always am i remembering this wrong she always wanted her father's approval mm-hmm. he was very much with with nope it's gonna it's gonna be kyle everything's gonna be kyle and then when that went to shit it, it was it was a disaster from that point on kyle was the only person she could talk to Mm-hmm. Equal to equal. The only person she could talk to without that stutter she used to have. Yes. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, but just, just in, in very much in the same vein as as Talia, the way Nash manipulated Jack mm-hmm. through the first few issues of that series, and then just tormented him through the entire series. Sure. Yeah. Brutal. Yep. And 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 you could you could say too that. Uh, it's it's almost reminiscent of almost like a Catwoman Batman relationship between the two of them, but way I more, think way more yeah, way, way more vicious, way more creepy. Oh yeah, yeah. Nash was much less ambiguous in her yeah. evil than, than Selena yeah. ever has been. Certainly, I, I I would even think she enjoyed her evilness in some ways. Hmm. Yeah, well, 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 because it made her what she was, you know, and, and and it gave her it gave her a bit of confidence that she lacked beforehand as well. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's one of the things that you know, I mean, why are villains villains? Well, they're villains sometimes by circumstance and sometimes because they just like it. Um, and she, I think she's a little bit of a, a and a little bit of B there, you know. Like, yeah. sure, the circumstances led her there, but. I think she's perfectly happy being the person that she is, even if it's not exactly the most pleasant human being in the world. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff. And great list all around, uh, gents. I think this was a, a, an excellent way to cap off the legacy in, uh, in, in more ways than one. And I figured out why I was thinking differently in the beginning but before we started the show. Mm-hmm. I had thought we talked legendary, not legacy. Ah, that's what was messing me up well there you go there you that, go yep my fault wrong l word <laughs> but came came to it in the end anyway nice all right let's run through our alternates uh if we have them and uh Murd, uh let's start with you okay well let's uh, you know maybe i better go last my mind's kind of exhaustive <laughs> fair, fair enough uh, I'll, I'll just run through mine then uh, real quick here um, I had uh, Lady Octopus, Carolyn Trainer on mm-hmm. my list. Uh, came very close to being in my top five because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of that character. I think that uh, she's been underused over the years and is an excellent version of Doc, Doc, of Doc Ock in many different ways. Um, yep, went mostly as Lady Octopus uh, during her time. Uh, had, I had Jason McIndell Hobgoblin on there as well. Scandal Savage on her own. Uh, Icicle. Uh, which oh, that's a good one. Again, came very close to being on my list. Uh, another one of those uh, villains that has uh, been both over the years. You know, both a villain and a hero, uh, but could be incredibly menacing uh, at at points in uh, in Cameron's uh, existence, especially during uh, John's JSA run uh, before turning to the side of the angels for a little while. There, um, I had missed on my list as well, but I knew you were going to say it, Shane. So that's why it remained an alternate. Solomon Grundy. On, on my list. Yeah, well, I thought of him too. Yep, because uh, along the same lines of Ultron, there's oh, been yeah. many, many a version of Solomon Grundy over the years, mm-hmm. and, and each one has been significantly different. Um, for that matter, Bizarro uh, on my on my list. Uh, me me am ha- uh, upset that he alternate on list. But uh, again, each version of Bizarro, unique and different. Uh, there have been many, many versions over the years, and, uh, you know, uh, each one a legacy of their own and quite literally a legacy from Superman himself, if you think about it that way. So uh, I've got uh, Mirror Master, uh, Evan McCullough on, on my list. Uh, I much prefer this version of Mirror Master over the original, personally. I think that, that this one's been uh, a lot more a lot more menacing uh, over the years and also uh, more of a nuanced character as, as presented uh, than the original Mirror Master. Uh, I had Alex Walker Trickster on my list as well. Alexander Luther Jr. on my list here. Oh, that's a good one too. 
you know oh i mean the the red mullet and beard guy from the early 90s <laughs> yeah well that that's lex luther too uh i'm talking crisis uh, uh alexander luther uh, oh from earth three yes from earth three yeah because mm. you know still a legacy still a luther so in in one way in one way it or still another becomes evil exactly still becomes evil so consider considered that uh on my list didn't include them because of the fact that uh, the father was technically a hero but it's a Lutheran mm. name, so you know yes, I had right. to at least throw it in there as an alternate. I think he's due for a redemption too. Yes, honestly. Yeah, this Superboy Prime finally got his due. I think Alex needed. It. In fairness to him, he was raised in a vacuum. He grew from infancy to adulthood in a matter of days. He didn't get a chance to be socialized mm -hmm. to adopt proper values. I mean, he, yeah, what, what he did in Infinite Crisis, it, uh, I think it's forgivable, honestly. Agreed. Yeah. When when, when did Superboy Prime get his? Redemption. Very recently, actually. I it was, was just very... wondering because it was at the tail end of Scott Snyder's whole uh, Dark Knight's death metal thing. Oh, yeah. huh. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I still need to read it myself. I haven't gotten, yeah. it, but, I, but I have heard that there's, uh, hmm. you know, at least some, some redemption there in one form or another. Wow. Uh, Lex Luthor Chu is also on my list. The uh, the mulleted red uh, red haired uh, Lex Luthor. That was actually just Lex Luthor in a cloned body because the 90s. Um, they saved Luthor's brain. <laughs> nice. Uh, and uh, Ragdoll on, his, on, on, on their own is on my list. Uh, and I also included uh, The Prowler. I, I, I know that, uh, that Prowler is sort of an anti-hero more than a hero at times, but... Uh, more than a villain at times, but there have been many people in the Prowler suit over at Marvel Comics, uh, and and figured I'd I'd throw that in there as well. And it, it hasn't just been Hobby over the years; it's been a couple of other people. Uh, some most of the time working with Spider Man, but uh, not always. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I put I put it in there as well. Um, and I, that's uh, those are my alternates off the top of my head here. I'm sure I'll probably think of seven more after you guys speak. But uh, Shane, any alternates? I really only had. Talia, Clayface, uh, Venom, Carnage, Solomon Grundy, and Ragdoll. Nice. They're the only, the only ones I came up with in, in thinking quickly. All right. And now for the exhaustive list. Okay. Well, not quite as exhaustive as it would have been a minute ago because there's actually a good bit of uh, overlap between mine and yours, Ian. Nice. Let's say. Uh, overlap number one is actually with Chris because uh, Helmut Zemo was very high on my list of alternates. Mm -hmm. And it was, that, as I said, it was in, in deference to Chris and my assumption that he would probably have has Zemo pretty high on his own list. I didn't put sure. him on mine. So, but and I put the Dr. Sofen on there anyway for, for the Thunderbolts love. Uh, let's see. I've got a couple of uh, Bronze Age replacements or legacy bearers for classic Superman villains. I've got Jack B. Nimble, the second toy man, uh, who oh. uh, was a a part of the Superman comics for a few years in the 70s, just long enough to get his likeness onto the Super Friends cartoon. I've also got Roger Corbin, uh, the Metallic. Oh, that's a good one, too. Bronze Age. Nice. He of the orange and green armor. I always thought that was a really cool visual design. He was the brother of the original who died in his first appearance in Action Comics number 252. I've got Evan McCullough on here. I definitely agree with you, Ian, that he's a, a better mirror master than Sam Scudder, who never had much personality, just a generic con who figured out tricks with mirrors. McCullough has a real sadistic streak. He's got a cool accent. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, thanks to both his creator, Grant Morrison, and Jeff Johns later on, he acquired a couple of interesting and disturbing levels. Certainly. Um, speaking of generic ex-cons who adopted other people's identities, uh, Blackie Drago, the second vulture. <laughs> uh, not much to him. I just think it's kind of cool that a random celly of Adrian Toomes put on the costume for a, a minute. Uh, I definitely have Jason P. Masondale Jr. as uh, the Hobgoblin and uh, the original Jack-O-Lantern on my list, too. And let's not forget the Demo Goblin. Hmm. Good oh, right. And a wrinkle to the Hobgoblin legacy that happened there thanks to the Inferno event. Yep. Uh, I've also got uh, Cameron McKent, the Icicle, on my list. I agree that he walked the fine line between hero and villain in a satisfying way. Yeah, I recommend people check out uh, an arc in the early issues of JSA Classified called Honor Among Thieves, mm -hmm. which is about uh, Mr. McKent yeah. and his version of the the just the Injustice Society as they basically pull off a Golden Age villain heist story. And it's just a good example of uh, camaraderie and even family among super criminals. It was, I think it's uh, Cameron at his best. Uh, let's see, I've got, uh, 
Larry Cranston, uh, who is an old uh, law school rival of Matt Murdock, and for my money, the most interesting of the characters to bear the identity of Mr. Fear. Ah, nice. Ah. Um, I've got uh, Chal Andar, whom you probably know better as Charlie Parker, the Golden Eagle. Nice. Uh, who was a, he was a member of the Titans West back in the 70s, and uh, uh, eventually he was refitted by Jimmy Palmiotti and Justin Gray as a Hawkman legacy villain. Yeah. They established that he was the son of a Thanagarian agent named Fel Andar, who's kind of a complicated continuity patch character. But <laughs> long story short, uh, Golden Eagle is was a Hawkman legacy villain for a little bit there. Yeah, Palmiotti and Gray did a really good job with that arc, so I'm glad. Oh. Yep, they did a good job just uh, fleshing out Hawkman's rogues gallery yeah. in general. So yep. props to them. Um, going back to Daredevil, I've got uh, the second Gladiator, a guy named Wiley Lemick. Uh, he didn't show up in very many comics. I think Joe Kelly created him. Uh, but he was a, a mental patient who was under the delusion that he actually was an ancient Roman gladiator. And uh, he spoke accordingly. I mean, he didn't speak Latin, but he, he spoke in kind of the high-flown pseudo-Elizabethan manner that he probably imagined a Roman gladiator should have spoken in. And uh, he was just, you know, Melvin Potter is a cool character in regard, but uh, I thought this new gladiator, who regrettably hasn't been seen in a while, was a good way to, to fill his vacant gladiator boots. Uh, let's see. Uh, of course, uh, Eobard Thawne, the reverse Flash. You know, talk about a really... Really twisted and sadistic version of, of, of a legacy figure. You know, he's, he's, he's yeah. distantly descended from uh, Barry Allen's long-lost evil twin brother, Malcolm Fawn. So you want to talk about your legacies, uh, Reverse Flash has to be in there. Um, I definitely have Carolyn Trainer, uh, Lady Octopus, on my list too, Ian. I completely agree with you about her. You know, she's a, a great uh, inheritor of, of the octopus arms. Mm -hmm. uh, I love how she was kind of reverent towards her old mentor, Otto, and uh, stepped aside when he returned from the dead. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we're seeing a little more of her in the current Ben Riley Spider-Man series. I just thought she was a great visual, you know, that uh, octopus symbol on her belly. Yeah, agreed. Uh, let's see. I've got uh, Cynthia Schmidt, the daughter of the Red Skull. Oh. Yeah, I'd, I'd completely forgotten about her. Yeah, nice. Yep, she's a bad little mother. Uh, I've got uh, Blackheart, the son of Mephisto. Definitely following in the family business there. Uh, speaking of family businesses, uh, Shane, you mentioned in passing Richard Fisk. Uh, yeah. He went by uh, Rose, Blood Rose. Rose, and the Schemer at different times. So, yep, I got him on there, too, who also tried to take over the family business uh, by force. Um, I've got, uh, if you want to think of a legacy as like a, a communicable curse between bearers, I've got Wendigo on here from the Marvel Universe. Yep. You could also put uh, the Fisherman from the DC side of things, since eventually it was revealed that the Fisherman was not just a, a criminal in a costume. It was actually that stupid looking polka dotted hat he wears is actually an alien parasite that uh, possesses different hosts. Somebody at some point uh, threw that in there, so I, I put Fisherman kind of as a, as a low-ranking <laughs> alternate on my list. Um, I've got Mark Shaw here, who has been a, a legacy holder of the Manhunter, um, yes. and, and has walked uh, the fine line between hero and villain, and has fallen hard on both sides at different times in his history. Uh, most recently, he's a villain, uh, since I think he's uh, kind of usurped control of the Leviathan organization, away from Talia al Ghul of late. Most recent Checkmate miniseries by Bendis uh, deals with him. Um, I've got uh, a villain uh, who is a member of uh, Injustice Unlimited back in the 80s. Uh, Rebecca Sharp, alias Hazard. Uh, she's the granddaughter of uh, the, the Gambler, classical Golden Age villain. She had the ability <laughs> to manipulate probability fields. She wore a really cool-looking uh, uh, costume. It was, it was like old-timey casino employee from the waist up and Zatanna from the waist down. And yeah, she hasn't been seen in a while either. What I liked about her was that she had more of a moral compass than some of her fellow Injustice Unlimited members, including Cameron McKent, I might add, who was a little more bloodthirsty in those days. No compunctions about killing. Becky Sharp did not want to kill anybody and ultimately turned against her teammates. So it would have been cool if she could have joined some incarnation of the Justice Society at a later time. Maybe somebody will make that happen eventually. Um, speaking of... Uh, Casino themed JSA legacy villains, Roulette, uh, who uh, oh, that's a good one. at least believed herself to be the granddaughter of uh, Mr. Terrific for a yeah. while. She's something of a legacy figure. Um, I've got uh, from the Secret Six, I've got Ragdoll Jr. We all seem to <laughs> have cleaved to that character in our alternates lists. Yep. And also uh, a figure that uh, Gail Simone introduced as kind of a 
a supernumerary in that book. Uh, didn't get to flesh her out too much, but uh, she was called Virtuoso. She was this uh, creepy Mort Morticia Adams looking lady who played a violin and was able to manipulate it to various supersonic effects. And she described herself as a disciple of uh, Isaac Bowen, the recently deceased fiddler, another classic golden age bad guy. So I would have liked to have heard a little bit more about her relationship to Maestro Bowen. And uh, maybe Gail Simone will get back to her someday, too. Uh, let's see. Classic DC legacy. I've got uh, Brother Blood here. Hmm. since uh, it's that, That's a line stretching all the way back to 1202 AD. Wow. Uh, I've got both Ultron and uh, Solomon Grundy on here for the reasons that you've already uh, expounded, Ian. Uh -huh. um, I stayed away from the mist, and I also left... Uh, uh, the, the the Ludlow Dalt brothers, who assumed their father's identity as Alias the Spider, as also seen in Starman, because I thought they might show up on your list, too. Sean. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think about the spider. Yep, I got those on my alternates list as well. Uh, let's see, I've got the second uh, Mad Hatter, the guy with the mustache. Uh, the guy who was more into hats than he was into the whole Lewis Carroll vein. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to collect every appearance of that uh, largely overlooked legacy character whom the original Jervis Tetch claimed that he murdered off panel, but we never actually saw it happen. So maybe he's still out there somewhere. Um, I've got Brian Hibbs, alias Kangaroo 2, because it takes a special sort of person to carry on the legacy of the kangaroo. <laughs> was it was he named after the the uh, the comic book realtor uh you know retailer uh, Brian Hibbs or is that just a pure coincidence? It I I can't really confirm that Ian, but I think there's a very good chance that I, he was. I figured as much, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure he was ever actually established as Brian Hibbs in the comics. I think that might have been somebody who was compiling a handbook that decided, okay, here's a nod to this this figure in the comics collecting community of the real world. <laughs> he gets to be the namesake of the second kangaroo. Excellent. I hope Mr. Hibbs is honored wherever he is. Indeed. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I of course, you know, Bizarro being my favorite character in all of comics, he's at least on my alternates list here. He just didn't... He didn't strike me so much as a legacy bearer, as a legacy founder. You know, he didn't just, Bear. yeah, he, he went to Bizarro World and founded his own Funhouse Mirror counterculture. And also, I don't really think of him as a villain so much as a, he's not even really an anti-hero. He's an ore, O-R-E-H. He's, he's a hero in, in his own warped uh, moral system, but he just does it all backwards. So, yeah, for, for that reason, I just I, I decided to leave him off because otherwise, obviously, as my favorite character of them all, he would have to be my number one on my main list. Okay. Yeah. And I saved the <laughs> the weirdest for last, a truly twisted uh, take on the concept of legacy. Uh, Professor Power, another J.M. DeMatteis creation. Um, he, he was a... a political science scholar and advisor to four different presidents uh, who lost faith in America and its political system when his son shipped off to Vietnam and returned an incurably you know, brain-dead vegetative. And uh, he then cooked up an idea to basically take over the world, uh, the country, and run it his own way. He kind of a, a, a deep state thing before that was even a concept. And uh, he arranged to uh, have his... Uh, vegetative son's body encased in a superpowered armor and to have his consciousness transferred into said son's body so <laughs> wow he was both uh, founder and carrier of the same legacy in a single person that's <laughs> it's a little messed up uh, yeah yeah that's demateus making a, a complicated statement about the political state of affairs and, and uh, the, you know the the, 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 the highly destructive and unhealthy ways in which the generation gap was sometimes breached in those times. Uh, I don't think that statement was ever completely appreciated in its time because of the whole father-son mind transfer thing. <laughs> I think the bizarrery of it all kind of overshadowed whatever statement J.M. DeMatteis was trying to make. But still, it happened in comics, only in comics, and <laughs> there's never been another legacy like it. So this stuck me there is... The exclamation point on my list of all. <laughs> While you were talking, I thought up uh, uh, Hiro Akamura, the uh, the Japanese toy man. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yep, he's a he's a cool uh, he's a kid 
uh, genius that's uh, that's taken on the mantle of Toy Man, both for good and for bad over the years. I remember, he once made a composite Superman for uh, for Superman and Batman to fly around, right. right. like a giant right. mecha that was half Superman. Yeah, and Batman. that's yeah. right. Exactly. It was back in the McGinnis, uh, the Loban McGinnis days. Yep. yep, that was pretty cool. And also, Mongol Two and Mongal. Uh, are are to be mentioned as uh, they are both forebearers of the uh, of the Mongol legacy over the years, uh, and, and I've got one more. Uh, fro- there's an there's an amazing issue of a series that's often forgotten called Spider Man's Tangled Web. Oh, uh, yep. that that had an an, an issue involving uh, Leapfrog and his son, and the, the son. Fabulous. Exactly. The son puts on the fabulous Frogman suit uh, and dons it for that for that issue uh, to try to take on Spider Man and try to win back his his family's legacy and try to get the uh, some some money for the for the family as well in the process. Wow. Um, great issue, uh, and I was reminded of it as you were speaking here, so <laughs> wanted wanted to bring that up definitely. Yeah, that is a great choice, Ian, the fabulous Frogman. Yep. Yeah, I, re- I remember that issue. It was, it was one of the first things that Zeb Wells wrote for comics, as I yep. recall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, You're absolutely I was, correct. I was angry at him because he got uh, Frogman's surname wrong. For some reason, he changed it from Patilio to Colorito, and nobody mm-hmm. caught it. Interesting. I don't know how or why that happened, but it's <laughs> it, it, it's stuck in my crawl ever since. It was a good story, but uh, that little continuity snag forever soiled it in my sight. So close. We came so close to perfection. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, gents. Well, this this was this was an absolutely excellent time all around. Mm, uh, yes, and thank you very much, Ian, for another ex- ex- suggestion, a top five topic. Oh, yeah, it's a hundred percent my pleasure. As uh, I've been I've been itching to finish this up after after Heroes uh, many a year ago, and now we now we finally get to do so. <laughs> and I and, and I know I know we're running a little bit long, but I did kind of promise somebody that we'd finally get to it. So. Yes, indeed. He disappeared. (laughs) Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Oh, my God. Where'd he go? Oh, my God. He's back. (laughs) CGS Nation had to be denied (sighs) the ecstasy of the air harp this time because... I mean, we heard some stuff in the background, so we could just say that that's air harp uh, for any for any. I thought, I thought, my God, does he actually have a harp in there now? <laughs> yeah, sure. I, w- I was knocking over several appliances and things to get to it. Yeah, well, I, I, I wasn't gonna, but then I remembered that we literally have a muddle that's been sitting in the can since November 2020 that we mm. need to get to. Yes, and, and it was sent in by a, a good and dear friend of the show whom we've kept yes. waiting for too long. 100% the case. So uh, it is indeed muddle time here on CGS, and let's explain how they muddle, shall we? I would be delighted, Ian. Okay, Muddle of the Murder is a comic book trivia contest that we run here on the show, and it's a chance for you, the home listeners, to participate in all the fun and frolics here on CGS by sending in questions for me, the Murd, to attempt to answer. So if you'd like to try muddling the Murd, you have to come up with three comic book trivia questions, a Marvel question, a DC question, and a third question about comics from some third publisher. These questions must also pertain to periods of comic history, such that one of them is about comics pre-1970, one about comics between 1970 and 2000, including the years 1970 and 2000 themselves, and a third question about comics post-2000. Uh, please don't ask about things that are too, too micro-level, no weird little background details. Um, and also, please confine your questions to uh, story matter, nothing about uh, advertising or letters pages or house ads or that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so once you've come up with your three questions uh, and include their answers, uh, put them in an email and send it to uh, comicgeekspeak at gmail.com with Muddle the Murd in the subject line, uh, where Ian will find them, scoop them up into a special little folder, and he will then uh, bring them up when a Muddle the Murd occasion occurs in one of our episodes, such as is happening right now. He'll ask me your questions, and if I get all three of them wrong, I will be, at my own expense, mailing you a fantastic prize. And that prize is... 
This, that prize is what I was knocking furniture over in my attempt to grab a few minutes ago. Um, and uh, I'm going to need to scrounge a little bit for prizes after this. I've been muddled a little too often lately. Oh uh, but uh, our uh, would-be muddler today will be playing for another fine uh, tomorrow's publication, Comic Book Artist Bullpen which is a collection of uh, a uh, periodical publication called CBA Bullpen. It, co it collects issues number one through seven, and it's kind of uh, got a baseball theme going on here on the cover, as those of you watching on YouTube can see. And on the back cover, there are little uh, trading card style images of some of the artists spotlighted in this issue. Jack Abel, Terry Beatty, Fred Hembeck, Frank Boley, and George Tusca to name but a few. We've also got uh, contributions from people like Joe Kubert, Marie Severin, Walter Simonson, Sergio Aragones, Joe Sinnott, Kyle Baker, and more. Excellent. 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 Well, uh, this is a, again, a muddle that has accidentally fallen through the cracks. And it's time for Chris Beckett to get his due as he is a longtime listener of the show. And Indeed. I am happy to read his attempt here. As he says here, he you put out the call and I have answered. Having lucked out against Murd the last time, I returned to see if I can go two for two, not counting the times I was defeated previously. <laughs> well, let's see if you can get a streak going here, Chris. Uh, the odds are in your favor because, as I mentioned before, I haven't been doing too well lately. <laughs> well, let's, let's see if that continues here as we begin DC Comics pre-1970. Which I like to consider my wheelhouse. Let's see if it finds the strike zone. Here we go. In Doom Patrol, number 121, from 1968, during their climactic confrontation with Captain Zal and Madame Rouge, the eclectic supergroup must choose whether to sacrifice their lives for 14 ordinary fishermen in a small, crumbling town in New England. Can you name the town? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Well, Chris is a New Englander himself, so I can understand why he's tempted to ask a Maine question. But sadly, it's his undoing. The village was called Codsville, Maine. Bing, 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 <laughs> bing, bing. <laughs> it doesn't hurt that my parents actually picked me up a copy of Doom Patrol number 121 at a comic shop down in Williamsburg a couple of weeks ago. But, uh, oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. But it's... Doesn't, but it, it doesn't help that much either because I actually knew that before. So that is a amazing coincidence, by the way. Yeah, still, still the eighteen month gap is is crazy. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right, well, let's see how we do with the other two here. Uh, over to Independent, nineteen seventy to two thousand. In Valiance Exo Man of War number five from nineteen ninety one, the comic opens with Eric in Dover. Foxcroft, Maine. What is he doing there? I th I'm seeing a theme to this packet of this. <laughs> <laughs> what is he doing in Dover? Hmm. Okay, what does, a, what does an ancient European barbarian in a, an alien symbiotic war suit do in Maine? Uh, <laughs> Get a lobster roll, clearly. Yeah, lobster. Hang it out. Yeah, that's, that's not a bad guess, huh? I'm going to say he went for ice cream. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, he didn't. Uh, at Eric in the Exo armor is destroying the last of the alien bases in, on Earth to fulfill his vengeance against them kidnapping him from his village centuries earlier. Hmm. Well, okay. I understand yep. why he'd be miffed about that. Going to Maine for revenge. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> All right. And finally, Marvel. This, <laughs> the third act of this main event. <laughs> ah, uh, it's funny because Maine, uh, Marvel pre two thousand in two thousand. I'm sorry, post two thousand yeah, in two thousand four's yeah. She Hulk number one by the one and only Dan Slott and Juan Babio et al. Shoki is in the middle of her closing argument in court when she is called away on a priority Avengers call. She joins Captain America and the rest of the team in space to combat to combat what villain? Hmm. Oh boy. Okay, and I've I have read this, and it wasn't that long ago either. And I'm still in the middle of uh, Dan Slott's run on this. Um, and, uh, I don't know exactly what issue I'm up to. It's the one where a uh, Two Gun Kid uh, is uh, being he's being welcomed into uh, uh, Goodman, Kurtzberg, uh, Lee, Lieber, and Holloway. Uh, but. Yeah, still. So I, I read issue number one two summers ago. I should be able to remember this. <sighs> but 
I'm influenced here by the fact that there does appear to be you know, a main theme. So I, I know of a couple of Marvel villains who are actually from places in the state of Maine. <laughs> so if it's one of those two, I'm going to say Modoc. A ring a ding ding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> George Tarleton. The bonus question is where is Modoc born? Ah, oh, gosh darn. <sighs> You see, the other one I was thinking of was the collector, Basil Sandhurst. Uh, no, the collector, the, the controller, Basil mm, Sandhurst, mm -hmm. who was born in Kittery Point. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one, which town in Maine it was. I'm going to say Banger. And you are correct on the bonus question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm a slightly better showing this time. Much yeah. to this Wow. Somebody got their mojo back. Well done. <laughs> Well, Chris, this was a excellent time, even if it wasn't a muddle. And we thank you so much for hanging on with us as we waited for the right moment to do this. Clearly, that Roman, that right moment was right now. I just can't believe your parents actually picked up that issue for you a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's it's been for the time bubble logs, really. Just, just yeah, weird little synchronicities that afflict the life of a comics collector. Uh, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Well, uh, yes. thank you for your patience, Chris, and thank you for being such a good supporter of the show over the years. And, you know, this, I'm sorry I can't send you this baseball themed uh, collection of comic book artists, but uh, <laughs> let me say this much to you uh, just as in consolation Go Sox! Yeah, <laughs> there you go. There you go. I know Chris loves his Red Sox at least as much as Matt loves them. <laughs> <laughs> and and we got we got we still got uh Murd to jump out of his chair, leap across the room and knock over furniture in his honor. So I think that yeah. that, that that says a lot. Yeah, that's I don't it. think that's yeah. ever happened before. <laughs> uh well done, well done. Well, uh well gents, I believe we have finally reached the end of today's episode and thank you very much for sticking in there with us. This was a great time. Uh, a reminder to you folks out there uh, that if you would like to buy some comics and, hey, maybe for all we know, some of them will have stories involving Bangor, Maine or other parts of Maine. Like we don't we don't know until you try. But Sean Wheatley is going on whatnot and he is selling off his reader copies of his comics in bundles uh, for your ease and his. Uh, so if you head to whatnot.com, uh, his next auction is on may 13th at 9 p.m pacific uh midnight the next day eastern uh, so that's technically the 14th for eastern uh, and then the one after that would be on the 21st at uh, 3 30 p.m pacific 6 30 p.m uh sorry yeah 6 30 p.m eastern you wrote it wrong here so i keep saying the wrong darn thing anywho <laughs> either way uh, enjoy uh, what he has to offer there and head on to his whatnot auctions. We will post the links in the show notes and on the super group. So mm -hmm. thank you, Left Coast Love, for everything that you do. And of course, patreon.com slash comic geek speak. Continue to support us and we will continue to give you fine programming like today's episode. I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right, Shane. And have a damn fun time doing it too. Yeah. Next, yes, indeed. Yep. And next week, if things work correctly it may very well be a twofer if not it'll be a one for and then a one for after that but either way we got some great content upcoming i think there's a mm -hmm. movie coming out that we may have to talk about uh, just uh, just just saying something yeah i gotta figure out if uh if the kiddo can be on that oh i think he'll be he'll oh, be would... he might be home depending on what day we do it okay well, speaking of legacy we would love to have him on yeah yes yeah. exactly we'd love to have a strange time with him <laughs> yep 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 Aha. All right, Shane, over to you. All right. Visit us at comicgeekspeak.com to send us an email. The address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. To leave a voicemail, the number is 267-702-6642. I'm getting an intrusive phone call while this is happening that I'm ignoring. Uh, stop by thecomicforms.vanillacommunity.com. Tell us your top five legacy villains god i almost said legendary again ah. so go to youtube and find us at youtube.com slash comic geek speak follow us on twitter like us on facebook thanks to everyone who contributes to the episodes send us your medals we do eventually get to them and we as don't. always we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes one listener at a time
Dance party, dance party, dance party. <laughs>